podcast number 902. This episode brought to you by Squarespace. Uh, whether it's a portfolio or an online type of a store or a blog. Maybe you just want a blog, Katie, to talk about the things that you love. People love blogs. It's a nice current journal. <laughs> <laughs> you just current ex- day journal. You just explain that like someone's aunt. It's like a current journal. That's how journal. I would explain it to my mom. She'd be like, well, it's a blog. And I'd be like, it's like a journal. It's a web blog. Anyway, Squarespace will help you create anything you want with beautifully designed templates, customizable features. Creating a beautiful website is simple and intuitive. Just add and arrange your content with the click of a mouse. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com. Enter the offer code NERDIST to get 10% off your first purchase. Uh, that is squarespace.com. Offer code NERDIST. So uh, let's talk about the Nerdist Community Corkboard, which are uh, I, I, things that you can send to events at Nerdist.com that are of relevant to your interest from the Nerdist community. Yeah, this guy sent in. He didn't write his name, but he said he recently, or she actually, because no name again. Write your yeah. names, people. Hey, man, broaden your gender horizons, uh, Katie. <laughs> I just recently released a new game, and I thought the Nerdist community might like it. Asymmetric Games just released a slapstick comedy Wild West adventure role-playing game called West of Loathing. You basically think of it as stick figure Skyrim, but with beans and big hats. The Onion called it one of the funniest games in ages. The Guardian listed it as among the funniest video game of all time. So you can find it at westofloathing.com. I would play something just based on the idea of stick figure Skyrim. I know, right? With beans and big hats. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm very intrigued by that line. I don't know what it means, but I like well, it. That's why you should go play it and find <laughs> out. I also want to remind people that we have lots of podcasts on the network, like the Jackie and Laurie show with Jackie Cation and Laurie Kilmartin, Half Hour Happy Hour, uh, Bizarre States, Cashing In with TJ Miller, Pro You, Love Alexi, The Todd Glass Show. We have so many. You can find them at Nerdist.com, and you can subscribe and uh, rate and review them on iTunes, too, if you'd be so inclined. Fantastic. Uh, also, I have some stand-up dates coming up at uh, Acme in Minneapolis at the end of September, and also for the New York Comedy Festival at Caroline's in New York at the beginning of November. Uh, the American Comedy Company in San Diego. Lots of stuff. Uh, so that's all coming up, and uh, I don't have those listed anywhere. Shit. Now, I used to list that stuff at Nerdist, but it's not. It's weird to do that now because yeah. you know Nerdist isn't like my personal blog anymore, my yeah. personal web blog anymore, your personal journal, my personal current journal <laughs> uh, for your mom. This episode is Max Brooks, a dear friend of mine whom I adore, one of the smartest people I know. Uh, Max Brooks is promoting Minecraft the Island, which is his book, available now wherever books are sold. But uh, he's just the fucking best. And the first time Max was on, people went nuts over his episode. Yeah. He's so he's so smart. And, and it's really interesting, the stuff that he's into. and the, the This book was fascinating, the way he was talking about it. Yeah. So uh, pick up the book. Enjoy this Max Brad, uh, Brooks podcast return. And then uh, Max will just come on. Uh, <laughs> I think we need to get Max on like once a year. We just need to have him back on as often as possible. Uh, so that's Max. Uh, This episode also brought to you by Stamps.com. Getting to the post office sucks. It's it's not... It's not enjoyable in any way. No one likes going to the post office. I mean, unless you live in a small town where you're the only person who goes into the post yeah. office and maybe it's run by your friends. But for <laughs> most people, going to the post office is an assy experience. So avoid the hassle of the post office and mail everything from postcards, envelopes, to packages, domestic or international with Stamps.com. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail. You click print mail. You're done. You hand it to your postal carrier. And unlike the post office, it never closes. Uh, 24-7, they're going to send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage and help you decide the best class of mail based on your needs. So right now, you too can enjoy the Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in NERDIST. That is Stamps.com. Enter the promo code NERDIST. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. And now here's the NERDIST podcast, episode number 902, with Max Brooks returning and Katie rolling the thing. Now entering NERDIST.com. I brought Neil deGrasse Tyson's book, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry, next to your book because 
something has happened with books lately where the covers have gotten oh my God, really right. satisfying to touch. Look They're at this. very tactile and very. This actually, and it's the same color scheme. Yeah. It's so th- I, f- I thought that yeah they seemed they seemed like wow. cousins they seemed well, like it, little it buddies. It is true. Uh, Katie, I the, want you to. That's the most satisfying. It's like soft. No, it's it's basically like if we're going to spend money to make a book, it better be nice. <laughs> I mean, people don't hold books in their hands that often anymore. No. Uh, do you read book books or do you read on Kindle? I read. It depends on what I have to read. Okay. <clears throat> like if I have to do stuff for West Point, there's no way I'm reading a counterinsurgency manual. Okay. I have to listen to it. I understand. I have to do Audible for like the big, heavy text. But for fun, yeah, no, for fun, <laughs> it's I'm always just reading, you know. But who who reads those types of books out loud? Oh, not enough soldiers, I'll tell you that. But Audible has an incredible amount, like Petraeus's counterinsurgency manual. Yeah. It is on Audible. They might actually be sponsoring this episode of the podcast. It's not crazy that they might sponsor this episode of the podcast. So that actually works out pretty well. I wouldn't be surprised. I just finished a Marine Corps small unit manual for counterinsurgency on Audible. Uh Uh-huh. Now, how does someone read a book of that nature? Is it – because there can't really be a lot of – It's very dry. Right. Like it couldn't be read by Paul Rubin. You know? I mean, maybe. Make sure your intelligent network. Ah! <laughs> Beware IEDs. Ah! You know what? You're, you've, I think you've just uncovered that you need to start uh, doing children's parties as Pee Wee Herman. That, that might be another job. It's oh, time for you. You know what? I may go back to Audible and say, listen, you've got all these dry military texts, of which is not read by small unit commanders, but they should, if we, they're read by Muppets or celebrities... You know, that would be good. Now, it sounds like there's a – I can – I sort of detect a note that it should be narrated by the by those people. But why Why do you feel that, that – just because I don't I know the topic. <clears throat> so why should it be and why do you think it's not? You know, I, I think we have to take it seriously. So I, And yet you've got a bunch of – when we talk about platoon leaders, company commanders, these are guys in their 20s. And so who's going to sit down and listen to 27 hours Right. You know, of – dry military doctrine read on Audible. Right. So if you get it read by Daniel Day-Lewis from There Will Be Blood, right. you know, you're my competitor. Then people just stand up and listen. Sure. You know, or or just anybody cool. I would like – I'm listening to T. Lawrence's book, Seven Pillars of Wisdom. I have to now because it's all about counterinsurgency or insurgency in Arabia. But it's read by someone like – now, if it was Fassbender – Sure. I'd be there. But Fassbender could read it just like this. And he would be would awesome doing it. be fine. See, I think we – I think the government needs to bring back the draft maybe just for Bill Hader. <laughs> <laughs> just draft him and be like, listen, it's a special case. You have a special skill. You know, you're going to read uh, an IED recognition guide yeah. as Vincent Price. Why not – Get your dad to do it and just tell him it's a comedy piece and he'll bring a lot of like uh, – he'll bring a lot of character work to it. He might have flashbacks to the IEDs that he diffused. I guess that's true. Yeah, when he was in the war. Oh, my gosh. You know, him and Carl. That's he, incredible. But, you know, he liked to give Carl a hard time because Carl was in the theater core. OK. So Carl will say things like, you know, when I was on Guadalcanal. And my dad will be like, you were on Guadalcanal a year after it was secured <laughs> playing Laertes. <laughs> You weren't on Guadalcanal. He was on Guadalcanal the way someone's on Broadway. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's kind of the way that somebody says, you know, like, I, I, was, I was in Sarajevo. And it's like, yeah, you were in Sarajevo in 2014. Right. <laughs> I'm glad they still harass each other. Right. Oh, there. Is there an yeah. alpha harasser in between the two or is it pretty even? No, it's pretty even. And then they, they take turns falling asleep, mm-hmm. doing tandem sleeping. Yep. And then they wake up and yell at the other for being asleep. Right. And then my dri- my dad drives home from Carl's house every night, 90 miles an hour, mm-hmm. and gets very angry when he can't talk himself out of a ticket. Because <laughs> I would say I would say half the time a cop will stop him. Oh, you know, you're, you're Mel Brooks. Oh, my God. Grow up with your stuff. Listen, please don't drive so fast. It's 3 in the morning. It's dangerous. But God forbid he runs into, like, millennial cop. Right. And there are a few. And they're just like, sir, I, I don't know who you are, and I don't know what saddles you're blazing, but um, – <laughs> 
please don't place them here. Yeah. But please I'm going to have to write you a citation. Uh, does, he, does he pay the tickets? Are you be like, what are you going to do? Yeah, no, he, ha- he, he's, he says, all right, all right, I'll go online. So he gets his assistant, and then he yells at his assistant on the computer. Why would I have to answer that question? I'm never going to do that. Well, I mean, I, you know, I showed you the thing when he came in of the uh, Gene Wilder's uh, glass hand-painted credit plate from yeah. Young Frankenstein. And I have to show you the – I got in a bidding war over Dark Helmet – as as you should. But There's, I but I now own Dark Helmet, which is amazing. There's only one. There's only one Dark Helmet, which totally uh, puts pay dirt to me because I thought I was pretty hot stuff writing on the deck chairs from Spaceball One. Oh my God, that's awesome. We still have them. We have them, and we have the floor lamps from President Scrooge's office in my dad's attic. So that's my office. Oh my God, that's incredible. You also have a limited edition Mel Brooks. That's true. He's one of one. As far as I know, there's only one. Yeah, you did. He was taken out of the wrapper, but I still feel like he's in very fine condition. And he's over at my house every night. <laughs> I'm sure he's coming over tonight. <laughs> Do you stay up and watch TV with him? What do you guys watch? No, no. He has a routine. He comes over from the office around yep. 6 yep. and hangs out mainly with my son. Yep. And they hang out together and my son gets to tell him inappropriate things. Yep. And then he goes to Carl's. Mm-hmm. And then he has dinner at Carl's like around 9. Yep. And then they stay up till about 1 or 2. Yep. Then he comes home and then the whole process starts over again. So we're just a way station because mm-hmm. he can't go to Carl's too early. Carl's not ready for him. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. You're you're a stop on the way to yeah. Carl. You're you're really just. Oh wow, yeah. You're like uh, Baker, California. We really are on the way to Vegas. Yeah, you're basically the world's tallest thermometer with the yeah. the Mad Greek. We're Barstow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should open a factory outlet yeah. mall in your Mel's backyard. Mel's Barstow. <laughs> Mel- Melstow. Yeah, it's funny that you say that. How old is your son? Twelve. Oh, he's twelve. Oh, okay. Because I, uh, my nephew is eighteen, and I've discovered that he also has a very inappropriate sense of humor, which, of course, I applaud. I just want to read you a little text exchange oh from right before you got here. Uh, I, I have a friend who is a germaphobe and only uh, bumps fists, and he says, he says, uh, "Please tell me you shook his hand." And I go, "No, no one shakes his hand. He fist bumps you." And then he wrote back, did he fist you? And I go, oh. yeah, I misunderstood. So he put his fist in me by mistake, in quotes. And then he – and then I – so I think it's done. I think, okay. Yeah, I, you I've, zinged him. I've put the button on uh, – Mic check. drop. Oh, no. Then he writes, hope he was wearing a glove. Everyone has to get the prostate exam at some point. And I write, now you tell me. <laughs> now I think it's done. Yeah, there then we go. And he writes back, it's not weird unless you clinched. Now I'm getting proud of him. I'm oh, like, okay, he's, he's really he's going deep on well, this. And so I to said, speak. I said, good tip, which is also what I told him. hey oh, And he said, another good tip is anal bleaching, then it's sanitary. Now, I feel like he went one step too far with the joke. You know, he went right. like one step too far. But I am very pleased at his developmental uh, But you can progress. teach that. You, you, you can teach when to say goodnight, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, you, exactly. You can't teach will. No. <laughs> You can't teach the fire. I can I can teach him like after three beats, it's done. Right. But you know it. Uh, but but it, but it is. But I love that. I am very proud that his brain is working in that direction. Yeah, that's you. You can't teach that. Like I, I can teach my son. You know when to say things, when not to say things. But I can't teach him to love watching Roots, right? And, which is what he does every night. That's his favorite show now. Oh, incredible! So we have to sit there and watch the 1970s miniseries Roots, and he deconstructs it. That's. Incre- your it's, son must be a genius. I, uh, I may not live to see his adulthood. He's going to be a great adult someday, but he's killing me. Because <laughs> he deconstructs it, too. And he says, he says, Dad, so if Kizzy was raped by Master Moore, then how come Chicken George is darker than Kizzy? Oh, wow. Yeah, he goes that, that So deep. he's doing all of the cultural math. Uh, yes, it. and the genealogy. And I have to say to him, like, well, honestly, son, Ben Vereen was just who they cast. Right. And he happens to be darker than Leslie Uggams. So he was – so he's de- he's deconstructing it as though it was a real – like a, a yeah. documentary. He's literally looking at it as, as and you're, happened. you're explaining – you have to explain to him like this is just a, a, a fictionalized account. Like, yeah. Th- this is basically just a theatrical – accounting of these events and but he's always looking for flaws he's always looking for production flaws story flaws his favorite online show is how it should have ended uh-huh. <laughs> which he loves even if he hasn't seen the movie you know this type of stuff and then having these exchanges with my nephew and also hearing about people like tom kinney's kid who apparently knows so much about silent films 
is like, wow, unbelievable. You actually can get kids into cool stuff, and it's not all. You know, we're not not, not everyone lives in Kardashian. No, no, there's plenty. I, you know, I. I meet a lot of millennials, but I also meet a lot of 21st century Americans. Yeah. Just dedicated, smart people who happen to be young Mm -hmm. and really are curious about their world and want to make a difference. Right. But we don't talk about them. Now, did you instill any of this in him on purpose or did you just allow him to discover things? No, he gets it. He gets it all on his own. What I have to teach him is the discipline. Sure. Two years ago, he wrote a whole musical for his class uh, based on the movie Casablanca. Okay. Because he loved Casablanca. It was his favorite movie. And then he said, but is there a musical? I said, no, no. He said, well, I'm going to write one. That's him. That came from that came from DNA or God or whatever. Please tell me it's called Play It, Sam. Yeah. It, no, it's literally Casablanca, the musical. That's like the musical. Okay. I have to teach him things like you have to rewrite. You have to keep at it. Uh, you have to finish everything you start. No, you cannot have a joke of smacking a blind person. Right. And he said to me, why? And I said, because that would hurt the feelings of blind people, to which he said, but they won't see it. Sure. That's a, you know, a reasonable... I thought, okay, let me get back to you with that. <laughs> it's very difficult to... <laughs> the, nu- the, sort of the, the nuance of the cultural conversation is very difficult to explain, I would imagine, to a child because, you know, they sort of... They probably have formulas in their head where they go, well, if X is okay, why is Y not... Well, because... Right. Because you just can't. Yeah. Oh, oh, we're running up against this all the time. And especially I would imagine if you're if, – if, you, if he goes, well, my grandfather wrote and directed <laughs> History of the World Part 1 and that's loaded with – why can't I? Well, it was a different time. It's a little bit like if a father is trying to keep his kid off drugs but the grandfather is Pablo Escobar. Of course. Yeah, I can understand how that would be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've often thought of Mel Brooks as the Pablo Escobar of comedy. He kind of is. And so I'm, it's hard to tell my son, no, you can't say that. And he'll say things like, well, Dad, if black people call each other the N-word, why can't we call each other the K-word? I said, no, you, you just can't. You he's, just like, can't. he's like, well, why don't we? I'm like, because we don't. He's like, well, what if I started a trend? I'm like, please, please don't. don't. Please don't start a trend. That's not a trend <laughs> please, to start. Please don't do that. And so does your dad... I would assume he encourages this kind yeah, of... Yeah, we got in a huge generational fight a couple of years ago when he was doing... My son was doing Notable Americans. Mm-hmm. He was going to be FDR. Okay. So he wanted to do it as FDR, a polio comedy. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he had a whole routine. He had a whole Looney Tunes routine of FDR suddenly getting eye polio... <laughs> And rolling off a cliff. And I said, no, you, you can't. can't do that. And so Henry's like, why? I'm like, it's just wrong. He's like, but dad, nobody in the audience has polio anymore. And I said, just trust me on this one. And grandpa said, what? It's funny. You should let him do it. FDR, polio comedy. Did you let him do it? No, <laughs> absolutely not. Well, you know what's good is that if you were the comedy person, it would be very difficult to justify. Yes. So at least you're sort of the buffer between the two. But I also sort of feel like maybe there are some <clears throat> maybe there are some places where you let him do that stuff, and if it doesn't fly, then he kind of learns. Well, what we do is is we have to ration out inappropriateness. Sure. Like when we went – a few months ago, we went camping on Santa Rosa Island, just the two of us. And we okay. told each other ghost stories. He told me his little ghost story. And I told him the story of The Thing. Okay. John Carpenter's yep. The Thing. And he was so excited, not because of the scariness, but because it had bad words. Right. So I said to him, okay, if you – don't mouth off in class and don't get sent to the principal's office for the whole rest of the year. At the end, I will let you watch that last scene of Kurt Russell confronting the thing and saying what he says to the thing. And he's like, really? And I'm like, okay, just remember that every time you're about to do something that's going to get in your trouble. And sure enough, clean slate. Wow. So we showed him the last 30 seconds of the thing. Did Was, did, was he like – Super excited, or did he feel like yeah. it was worth behaving? He all that was time? very for to see Kurt Russell, who he had just been introduced to from Guardians of the Galaxy. Sure, to see Kurt Russell say, "Yeah, well, fuck you too," yep. to a giant alien, that's worth it. That was worth it for the rest of his. That yeah. made his year. So now I got to find something else wildly inappropriate. <laughs> 
You're gonna, you, you might, you might, you might. Now that he's about to hit puberty, you might have to up it to like Pornhub categories. Yeah, he's he. Thank God the hormones have not kicked in yet. He's getting there. Sure, he's getting there. But uh, and we'll know soon enough because he doesn't keep anything to himself. <laughs> there's, there's, there's not a lot of hiding. You know, we've the men in our family. We have we are multi talented. There's a lot open to us, but yes. there's a lot of doors that are closed, mm-hmm. like ninja. Mm-hmm. You know, spy, riverboat gambler, anything that has sort of subterfuge yep. and stealth mm-hmm. is lost on sort of the Brooks men. I, I, I totally understood. Totally understood. So you would you would be a very poor spy. I would be a horrible spy. My dad would be a horrible spy. But I feel like because you said that, you'd actually be the perfect spy. If I could, if I could be like Claudius, you know, like I Claudius and sort of pretend to be a buffoon, but really be super smart. Yes. Uh, but no. But you're doing all this in, all the, all this intelligence study. But it's all out in the open. There's, yes, but you're not picking anything up along the way? I have, but I haven't – like no one's reading me into anything secret. OK, OK. It's basically all this – it's basically all the stuff that everybody already knows but no one's ever thought about. Gotcha. You know, it's the kind of thing where – like I just wrote an article about North Korea and one of their dangers is using an EMP like in The Matrix. Right. And technically is that an act of war because you're not actually hurting anyone by using an EMP. It's the secondary and tertiary. Yeah, reactions. it is, but but those there's but, no there's no legal framework. We could decide to go to war, but there's no legal framework that automatically triggers war. But to de-technify yeah. uh, a culture uh, is it's like a cyber attack. A tremendous amount of would be inflicting a tremendous amount of harm in the way that people do business. I mean, is yes, it's not. It, maybe it's not necessarily. Well, it could kill people who are you know attached to uh, met- heart machines. Exactly. And, yeah. and so, therefore, we, if we wanted to make it completely legal and fair, we could respond in kind and you and use an EMP on them. Sure. But they're already in the fourth century. All, right. All their electronics were already hardened, and everyone else in North Korea is essentially living in the Stone Age. Okay. So you can't respond in kind. So I just have to ask. I just every time I look at the news, and I just sort of clench up. I mean, how how real do you think the threat is at this point, and how out of control do you think these uh, these uh, missile tests are and firing ICBMs into the sea? Kim Jong Un's people have no idea what Kim Jong Un is doing. So the only way he'd go to war is if we publicly insulted him in front of his people. Sure. And that was actually the threat of – remember the Seth Rogen movie? Right, the interview. Right. Well, the big issue with the interview was that people in South Korea were going to attach the DVDs to balloons and float them over to North Korea because that's literally the only way to get information over there. Sure. So as long as Kim Jong-un can look good for his own people, we're okay. Okay. But God forbid somehow we humiliate him, embarrass him in front of his own, then we're in trouble. Sure. Well, we've had the problem with North Korea is we now have successfully removed any lever that we can pull with them. We can't use trade because we don't trade with them. We can't use diplomacy because they won't listen to us. But we also don't understand the situation on the ground. The big threat of North Korea is not North Korea invading South Korea anymore. That hasn't been the threat since the 1980s. The major threat, the threat that the South Koreans understand is the organization of North Korea imploding. The big threat is actually Kim Jong-un being assassinated or literally opening up and suddenly having tens of millions. There's no infrastructure. Nothing. And you have tens of millions of starving people who've never been trained for a modern job, don't understand the working world. They're living in the Middle Ages. I mean, we're too, we're kind of too young to remember sort of what happened to West Germany in the 90s. Remember, we were in our 20s. So we were like, oh God, Kurt Cobain's dead. But there actually was other things happening in the 90s. Are you sure about that? Yeah. I'm pretty sure a few other things. I remember that happened. I remember Bill Clinton played the saxophone. And that that was it. But apparently it took West Germany 20 years to reabsorb East Germany. And at least East Germans were still living in the 19th century. Whereas North Korea... That would make South – that would literally pull South Korea under. That would be like when a ship sinks and it sucks everyone under. Well, yeah, and maybe we talked about this a little bit the last time you were on the podcast. But just the idea that let's say you had $50 billion, 
that it's it's not entirely feasible to go into a depressed economy and just go, well, here's $10 billion, no. fix all your problems. Because you, what That's you actually, the worst thing you can do. Because what you actually have to go in and do is because war, like people will take the money. And That's exactly what, right. And people won't know how to deal with it. The, the, the yeah. culture, the, there's not enough cultural infrastructure and there's not enough governmental infrastructure to know how to process and the, and you so you actually yeah. have to go in and infuse like an infrastructure that can handle uh, you know the, like something like an infusion and, of and this of is what we, we don't understand we should have un- we had a chance to learn this Americans are great at not learning lessons mm-hmm. and we should have learned this in Somalia in the nineties we should have understood that if you go in like you said with big bags of rice as a humanitarian mission the warlords will take the rice and then use it as power right and we realized oh there has to be a security element and oh you have to start building the infrastructure and oh my God. You're starting at year zero. You have to train these people up, and it takes 20 years. But, you know, I, I think part of that is that I think there's a real failing on the part of the American education system to not teach people ha- how to think about money or process money. Or Because yeah. I think Americans sort of think of us as like an all-or-nothing cash-based system where – you just throw money at a problem and then it goes away. And it's like that, that, that on, on a low level that, that can, yeah. you know, like, yes, if your car is fucked up, you can throw money at it and get a new car. But when you're talking about, you know, larger, more global economies or where you're talking about, you know, it, that you, it doesn't quite work that way, that there has to be a distribution process. And even during, even when they're fucking, even during debates, during presidential debates, you know, like when when Bernie was a, a, a potential contender, of course, and uh, and you know he was saying, "Oh, I want to tear down this, and we want to give all these people." And it's like, you know, I think who's going to pay for that? And I think I think people had this idea in their minds, and I'm not meaning to disparage him in any way. I mean, he seems like a lovely guy, but I just wanted to say to some people, like, there's not going to be a money parade like in Bat in, in the original Batman, right? Where all this money is just going to start coming. Like, it. I think it probably even costs a lot of money to figure out how to use the money properly yeah. and it's a little more complicated that and I, again I'm not oversimplifying I mean I don't mean to oversimplify what he was saying I, but I just I, I think it's much more complicated than people understand oh, no. and it's not just like <clears throat> fucking write a check right just write him a check and I think the major problem is that we are four we are now four generations out from the great leap forward we had in 1945 you know, the greatest generation understood how systems work. They understood what it took to keep the lights on, the water running, the sewage pumping. They understood how complicated a hospital was because they didn't grow up with hospitals. All the things that we grew up with and we take for granted, yeah. just like the generation before us took it for granted. You right. know, we're th- we are Gen X, baby boomers, millennials. We all think this stuff just happens. Right. We don't understand that in 1945, this country literally jumped into the modern world. And our great grandparents were like, oh, no, no, this takes a lot of planning and preparing and money and training and education. And so therefore, since we don't understand how our own civilization works anymore, we are flummoxed why we can't just build it overnight in Afghanistan. Right. And when you read – if you read anything from like the 1930s and you see what – it's really fascinating to see uh, how minuscule the United States military uh, presence was where you just – you know, I remember seeing some sort of a scale where it was like today's military presence and it was measured by, you know, each little soldier cartoon represented, you know, 10,000 people. And there was barely any in like 1930, 1931. But – but the greatest generation, also kind of racist, a little racist well, generation. Well, they didn't call it racist or sexist or homophobic. <laughs> they, they just called it living their lives. They just called it living their lives. They, but they did do they did do a lot of stuff. You know, they, I feel like they did. There are lessons to you know, good lessons to learn from them. If you try to ignore all of, I mean, if you scoop that stuff away. But but just the idea of how to think about maybe think about money but then of course after the war this sort of after world war ii this like oh there's a there's prosperity and now and i can understand the idea of you know we want to give our kids the baby boomers we want to give them yeah the a comfortable life that we didn't have because a lot of us were right. immigrants or a lot of us had to work and you know crawl into factory chimneys and we want them to – but then, you know, so the baby boomers get cushy. My generation gets cushy, you know. And yeah, we get cynical. We say, what's it all about? We look at the baby boomers. Well, because basically we grew up in the wake of the baby boomers' disaster. 
where they started out idealistic, we're going to change the world, and then don't trust anyone over 30, and then they turn 30, mm -hmm. and then they said, ah, screw it, let's just buy a whole bunch of shit and vote for Ronald Reagan. Yuppies! And we grew up in the shadow of that, and we thought, oh, well, I guess revolutions don't happen, and ideals don't mean anything, and suddenly you've got Christian Slater and pump up the volume going, you know, just don't know what's popular anymore. All right, it's so just... you got Rubens, and you could go to parties as Christian Slater. I could. You could, I, be, you could I, be a Christian Slater party club. I could read a counterinsurgency manual hey, as Christian kids. Slater. So, so like a kids. poodle when you're diffusing an IED. Remember, <laughs> cut the red wire, not the blue. And then you have millennials who basically just are staring at themselves all the time. Well, that's our fault. I blame, I blame all millennials' problems on us because we never taught them anything. We never said, kids, you don't get a trophy for showing up. Right. And you're not awesome. You can do awesome things. Katie is a big supporter of this point, by the way, of like giving everyone a participation trophy and I'm, of, of not giving one every, everyone a participation I mean, trophy. I was from the 80s. We didn't do that. I was right before. Well, it doesn't – it does not teach – it does not give you a skill set if you don't understand how to overcome – No. Uh, and, you know. and I think the great tragedy is millennials are statistically – just better than we were. They're much more idealistic. They're much more positive. They're much more philanthropic. They actually have the potential to do some great things the way us Gen Xers didn't. What we need to teach them is guts and resilience. We need to teach them grit, like how to fail, how to recover from failure, how to keep going. You're not always going to have a safe space. You're right. There's no such thing as a safe space, guys. Go out there and risk and fail and then pick your ass back up and do it. Well, if there, you know, if you can sort of look at cultural interaction as a form of Newtonian physics and you see that, uh, you know, the, the response to bullying and oppression and prejudice was to go in the complete opposite direction and now overcompensate for that by right. giving everyone a trophy. And the second anyone feels a little uncomfortable, like, oh, my God, let's change the entire university because you felt weird for a half a minute, you know, because it's very – it gets very gray if you're – if you know, if you want to – if you want to make sure that – one group feels supported, then someone right. else can go, well, okay, fine, but what about my thing? Okay, well, well now we need to – and then it just starts getting more and more no. granular and more and more specific. And so I don't, I don't have a solution. I don't know how to draw the boundaries. I, don't, I mean I want to always be respectful of everyone and make sure everyone feels supported. However, when you're young – and I was just talking about this with A.D. Bryant who was on the last podcast. I do cherish the fact that I was uh, socially ostracized and bullied – not to a degree where I was ever put in the hospital, but the thing about it is that it did make me try to problem solve and yeah. strive for better and <clears throat> strive to overcome. It was a nice – and you know, and I'm sure you know from writing when someone says to you like, you can write anything you want with no restrictions. A lot of times that's a huge pain in the ass or like just give me some direction, some boundaries that I can oh, yeah. bend and play with. Oh, and, my God. You know. But again, again, not in extreme cases. I'm not saying bullying is great. I'm just saying giving people ways to overcome you know, some adversity is not the worst thing in the world to learn how to navigate the world. Right. But I do – and I think, I think the problem is I think in our generation help causes is we made a big shift in the 90s where we saw injustice but instead of – doing good, it began to be about making people feel good. Right. You know, let, let us never forget, black people became African American so white liberals could feel good about saying African American. At the same time, Rodney King was being beaten within an inch of his life. Right. So it wasn't about, oh my God, the cops are using horrible force and they're supposed to protect people. It was just about using words. Right. It was like, well, let's rewrite the dictionary so everybody feels good instead of actually having to do the real hard legislative grunt work and dig in and make sure there's social justice. I mean, the fact that there is a giant Twitter rant against Steve Martin for saying Carrie Fisher was beautiful when he first met her. Yeah, that was that was that was that was upsetting because it basically says it's basically being saying to to someone you're not allowed to you're not you knew this person. It, it's He lost right. a friend. Right. He lost a friend. He wasn't allowed to compliment her. Now, that was a national outrage, whereas every day in states across the country, Roe v. Wade is being turned back. Voting rights against African Americans is being pulled back. Where's that outrage? Where's the freaking Twitter rants of tens of millions of people freaking out? It's so much easier to say, oh, my God, can you believe what someone said? Yeah. Who cares what they said? 
You know, personally, as far as last time I checked, Michael Richards is not in charge of a polling place or an abortion clinic. Right. He's a freaking comedian. Who cares what he said? What I care about is what people do. Right. And people are doing some really, really dark shit. And they're rolling back a lot of social progress in the dark. So you so you were of the mindset that a lot of people are being caught up in the minutia of uh, – with that, on the minutia of the way communication is happening, and not which does come from a good place, I assume, but not really taking the time to do the work to focus on this is how we enact, you know, like real. Yeah, I think everybody wants to be change. on stage doing the theatrics of social justice without doing the grunt work backstage. Right. You know, Samantha B had someone on her show, an old civil rights worker, and she made this wonderful speech about how. Civil rights for for all of the glory of the marches and Dr. King's speeches, there were millions of hours of people knocking on doors and getting sandwiches and filling out petitions. And there was just a lot of really unglamorous work. And I think for the first time in my life, I understand that old expression from before our time, the revolution will not be televised. I never got that. I was like, well, what does that mean? Of course it'll be televised. There's television. Now I get it. It means like, oh, don't expect to always be the hero in your own show. Sometimes you have to sweep up backstage to make good things happen. Right. And so is this some of the stuff that <clears> – <throat> is this any part of the stuff that you're writing now? Because the book – actually, it's kind of interesting because the, <clears throat> the book that you actually wrote was uh, Minecraft. You wrote a yes. Minecraft book. Yeah, well, the whole point for me of the book was when I discovered Minecraft with my kid, I realized, oh my God, this is the greatest single social teaching tool probably ever invented, ever. Because you're always trying to lecture kids on what to do. You're always trying to give them life tips and they're always rolling their eyes and they should. We didn't like to be lectured to. Nobody likes to be lectured to. Education should be fun. It should be interactive and you should own it. So how do you do that? Well, there's... Video games are the way to do it. The problem is most video games are actually modeled along the old 20th century industrial educational lines, which is there's a right way and a wrong way to perform a task. And then you perform the task the right way, and then you get rewarded by bumping up to another level. And that's like 90% of video games out there. And that's what it was like in school for us. There's a right way and a wrong way to do it. Minecraft, totally different. Minecraft, there's an issue a challenge like don't starve <laughs> but there's don't so go out at night right there's so many different <laughs> ways creatively that you can not starve you can hunt you could fish you could garden so you can be an individual you can be yourself you can solve the problem your way instead of the way someone else wants you to solve it but you have to do it within certain rules just like the real world right the mobs that come out at night in Minecraft, they don't care that you think you're awesome. <laughs> They're going to kill you. So you better find a way to save yourself from them. And that's life. The world of Minecraft doesn't care that you're awesome. Right. You have to learn how to survive. And Minecraft teaches you all these amazing tips. I mean, it teaches you patience and planning and preparation. And as I'm playing it with my son, I'm like, oh, my God. This game is a survival guide for life. This game is going to train my kid's brain to go out into the real world. And find a pickaxe. And it's literally like you have to make your own tools, and that's a great metaphor. Uh, And it teaches you how to fail, and it teaches you how to recover. You can build a big, beautiful house in Minecraft, and it'll burn down. (laughs) What? Because like an idiot, you didn't build your house out of bricks. You built it out of wood and you put lava in the middle of the floor because it looked cool. <laughs> now, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to cry and whine or are you going to get For a, a minute. Yeah, for a, you, and that's normal. You cry, you whine, and then you pick yourself up and you get back to work and you rebuild. Right. And that's totally going to click in with my son someday because we've all had issues. We've all had failures. We've all had moments where we're like, oh my God, I got to rebuild. Right. And there's a whole generation coming up now that's going to be like, oh, I've done this before. I've been trained to do this. Yeah. I only know how to solve problems by side scrolling uh, and uh, just flipping turtles on their backs and then jumping into a pipe. <laughs> that's, all, that's all I know how to do. And to talk like this. <laughs> hey, it's a me. Which to me, I used to call that Christmas at my mom's family. <laughs> 
Hey, Max. Actually, we, we weren't Italians. We were Italian Americans. Hey, how you doing? Hey, yo. Hey, hey so wait a minute. It's you, a me, Mario. They were like, uh, okay, so you telling me that that hot white thing that came up yesterday, yeah, the sun, yeah, that was the same thing that came up the day before. Get the fuck out of here. Unbelievable. This guy. What are you, some kind of wizard? Which made me realize, yeah, political correctness is great, but sometimes... Certainly in the case of my family, stereotypes can be very, very true. Yes. Listen, my mother, uh, you know, my my mother's uh, grandparents came from Italy and had 11 kids. Right. You know, like they, we got a lot. Of and it. back then, 11 kids was called medical insurance <laughs> because they thought, hey, we have 11 kids. If five will die, six will live. That's a good number. Also, yeah, we just play the number. You know, we play the numbers. They also, just, you know, we need to. Uh, is it difficult to find a good babysitter? So we go to make a babysitter. So we to just, babysit the younger kids. The first one to babysit the last one, and the Pope said, no, 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 you, you, you leave that in there. You leave that in there. <laughs> then you call out the Lord's name, and you make a new baby. I can't believe Chris and Max would talk about making social change and then do these offensive accents. I am offended. This is horribly offensive against Italian Americans. Wow. Just wow. That's always my favorite. Wow. Yeah. Just wow. There's going to be a lot of wow. Wow. Yeah, I know, because I'm sure I sound like an idiot talking about uh, political infrastructure. But uh, I, this is an interesting <clears throat> point that you have to bring up the fact that you've just joined Twitter like days okay, ago. Okay, all right. Can you please teach me about this? I'm an old – I mean basically we want to talk about stereotypes. Matt Brooks, author on Twitter. Hello. I I'm, I'm just joined the Twitter. By the way, so, you're great with voices. Why are, Why did you not do more you know, like well, comedy performance? Well, you know I used to do cartoon voices. Did I? I don't know if I did know you, that. Batman Beyond? Oh, come on. Did I not know this? Yeah, Howard Groot. Oh, shit. I was Terry McGinnis's, like, dorky friend. This is amazing. So by day, you're doing cartoon voiceover, and by night, you're writing about uh, by, counterinsurgency. Well, no. By day, if we're talking about cartoon voices, by day, I was doing Batman Beyond. This is 1999. By night, I was scribbling away at a little book that I thought no one would ever read called Zombie Survival Guide. I've, I've heard of this before. Yeah. Is there some sort of a world war that would come out of that? Apparently, not only was there a world war, some guy with awesome hair then saved the world on screen. You know, can I say you do I, – I would, I would buy you as a, as a Dick Grayson type. I could, I could have been – I could have totally been Dick Grayson. I could have been Terry McGinnis. They wouldn't let me. It was that Will Friedel because he had a job before. Oh, yeah, Will, of course. Yeah, who was awesome. But it's cool. I got to hang out with him and I got to sit next to Kevin Conroy. I mean – Who anything he says is cool. I mean really like the definitive Batman, Kevin and, Conroy. And they literally would be like, all right, we're going out for lunch. Kevin, do you want anything? He'd be like, I'll get a Whopper Jr. <laughs> <laughs> So what did you want to see? What do you want me to look at on Twitter? Okay, tw I will you teach me how to use Twitter? Because I'm I'm literally this is the telegraph for it's me. Very simple. You get mad about something and you write in all caps. What's hard about that? <laughs> so I just did it, and how does it work with retweeting and tweeting other people and and following? And and I, I'm completely ignorant. So all right. So let's say I decide to put something out there. Okay. You teach me how to use Twitter. All right. Yes. And I want to write uh, say. On Nerdist Now with Chris Hardwick. Okay. What do I do? <clears throat> you would uh, – I don't want to do it for you because All I right. want you to, be able to learn. All right. So yeah, teach me how to do so it. So you open your little dialogue box oh. there. You open Which, your little dialogue box. It's the, it's the quill. So that's a writing box, not a dialogue box. I'm sorry. It's a writing box. Okay. So here we are. Yes. What, it says what's happening. Thanks, Okay. Rerun. So what's happening? So write on okay. at, at – On at, at symbol Nerdist with – at Hardwick. With at Hardwick. Hardwick. Right now. And then uh, then push the push the little uh, push this little picture icon here, that little right okay. there. Okay. Yep. And now uh, hit photo. And then give it allow it to have access. I would like I would like it to access my camera. Now uh, flip the um, yeah to there. Katie's gonna. Katie's gonna hide. Here, Katie, do you want to do? I'll take it. All right. Yeah. Okay. And now. Okay. Okay. Now, now we've done picture. that. You got that picture. I've got that picture, and I I Can check. Check mark. Check. Yep. So now you've attached a picture to that, and you hit tweet. And I hit tweet. That's it. Look at that. Oh my God! There's a blue line going across my phone, which must mean that it's going to go out it's into the loading. world. It's so simple; oh. even a Max Brooks could do oh it. Oh my God! Oh, but of course, the signal is bad in here, so 
I'm going to give you my uh, Wi-Fi. Oh, thank you. Yes, just so we have... Uh, I'm such a Luddite. <laughs> uh, where did you park your settings? Okay, there you are. Okay, here we go. Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe update your phone. Maybe turn, maybe. How do you not have two-factor authentication turned on? You read a bunch of shit. You... I know. Please. It, my wife says if it was up to me, I would still be driving into the valley to check my, my answering machine. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, this is Jim Rockford. Leave a message at the beep. Okay, you are on. Uh, you are now on the Wi-Fi. This should tweet, and there you go. It's out. Twenty-three seconds ago. Wow! Look at that. These things are amazing. This. I think this is going to catch this, on. This, this is technology. wonderful. This this tweetering thing. It's just <laughs> offensive. Oh. Wow. So. Oh, I wow. cannot believe. I can't believe. Wow. Wow, that you would you would do anything ethnic. Hit Hitler on ice? Wow. That's... <laughs> oh my God, can you imagine my dad tried to make it today? <laughs> there are so many things about History of the World Part 1 or Space Falls, right? Just people would be like, that would, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that would get a lot of wows. People, I, I just can't believe you said that. Yeah, or Blazing Saddles or... And without oh even sort of God. realizing... And I think what's offensive about being mad about that is un- is when you understand where Mel was coming from. Yes. Having been through the war, having, you know, lived through a time of the Holocaust, having lived through, you know, being a Jewish American. And, you know, it's like, yeah, comedy is how you process the horrible, yeah. horrible shit pile of the world. And as he says, he's, he's, as my father says so brilliantly, Hitler's main weapon was terror. It was fear and intimidation. So ridiculing so him, turn makes him into him a smaller. Right, you turn him into a clown, and then you take the Mickey out of him. Right, and that's why neo Nazis never came up after the war in this country because they're a joke. Right, and so I mean, same thing with Blazing Saddles. You're making fun of the racists. You're not. Can you understand that? You're not being a racist. Right, 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 right. Yeah. He, when he was on the podcast, he talked about that and working with Richard Pryor. And, right. I mean, it was just absolutely incredible. And did he say that where Rockridge was, was, came from, the town of Rockridge? No. Came from Lawton, Oklahoma, where he was stationed in the Army, in the field artillery in World War II. Oh, wow. He did his artillery training in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He'd never been out of Brooklyn other than to go to VMI. And, you know, he gets off a train. He doesn't, he doesn't think these stories are interesting. I think they're amazing. Jewish kid from Brooklyn, never been south, gets off a train in Virginia, hot as hell, goes to a drinking fountain, starts to drink. Cop comes by and says, hey, boy, you, you know, don't drink there. And it said, coloreds only. So he, he was drinking at the wrong drinking fountain. He didn't know about Jim Crow. He didn't know about segregation. Sure. And he didn't, he's a, he didn't know... Was he white or colored or as a Jew, where does he... He didn't understand what, yeah. his, what his cultural identity was. Right, because in the South, it was very clear. There were no Jews. Right. You were either white or you were black. And he's like, uh, where do I fit in on this? And then he was interrogated when his unit got to Germany. He was interrogated by the intelligence corps for being a German-American. He had to do a loyalty test. Oh, wow. Because it didn't matter even if you were a Jewish-American. His father had come from Germany. My name is Maximilian. From Danzig, subject of the Kaiser. So they had, they interrogated him. You know, how do you feel? You might be killing Germans. You might be killing members of your own family and, you know, army bureaucracy. Sure. He's like, trust me, I'm not pointing a rifle at anybody in my own family. Right, right, right. But we forget in the broad cultural narrative of this country, this is what happens in every war. That there's people of a certain ethnicity that may have to point a rifle at their extended family. And... We forget it happened in Vietnam, it happened in Korea, it happened in World War II, my God. Uh, and it's happening now where Muslim soldiers are having to point guns at other Muslims. So we, every time we have a war, we have to say, okay, let's remember what it means to be an American. It's never easy. And are you uh, – when you're, when you're reading about counterinsurgency, is this – Really just so you can write for your collective or – I mean obviously it's something that you're fascinated by. It is. But what I'm, what I'm trying to do is tr- – I mean I don't know if I'll ever be successful <laughs> at it. But what I'm trying to do is bridge the gap between the American people and the people tasked with protecting them because the, the warrior class – and I like to say now the emerging warrior caste, which I like to pretend I made that up. OK. But I took it from Babylon 5. <laughs> As we do most things. Yes. I mean, it literally was about five, six years ago, I was speaking at West Point. That was the first time I used the phrase, the warrior cast. Uh, they are completely insular at this point. They speak their own language. I go to these conferences and I'm thinking, oh my God, you guys have no idea how to talk to us. 
And that would be okay if we lived in a dictatorship where the ruling class could be like, listen, peasants, you go do your thing and we're going to – we got this. But we live in a republic where we're the boss. We vote. And so we need to understand what's happening so we can vote for the right people to make the right choices for us. And if we don't understand the bigger issues, how are we going to vote right? So I try to take these big complex stuff that I hear at West Point, Naval War College, TRADOC, the Army's Training and Doctrine Command, and I try to break it down into language that I can understand. Because as a dyslexic kid who barely got through high school, uh, if I can understand it, maybe the average American can too. Right. So that's the stuff I'm always writing about. Uh, did your son inherit the dyslexia? No, thank God. Oh my God, it's so much easier for him. So much easier. Uh, dyslexia just, it, it crushed me as a kid. And he's, he's got other issues, but not dyslexia. So thank God. He can sit down with a book and he can go right through it. Can you write super fast or do you, does it take you a minute? You know what? I can write super fast, but proofreading I suck at. And... Every time I would write a draft of the Minecraft book, they would send it back to me and say, okay, can you, do you want to just make sure our proofreading is correct? I'm like, yeah, no. Uh, I have no idea. I'm just going to trust you on this. <laughs> it may be a good public speaker because I can't read a speech. I can't read from a prepared speech and I can't read from a cue card and I can't read from a teleprompter. So when I get up to talk, I sure shit better know what I'm talking about. Right. So I can never bullshit and I can never be busted on anything because whatever I'm talking about, I know it backwards and forwards. Well, and you also have to have – an understanding of yeah. what you're saying. I have to have supreme confidence in the material that I'm speaking on. Right. I, I have to really understand it because there's always a QA and a after I speak. And if it's a prepared speech, I who knows? What are common questions you get after your speeches? Well, uh, for the first time at West Point when I spoke, I talked about the dangers of creating a warrior cast. And a cadet asked me, he said, well, what's wrong with that? I said, what's wrong with it is we don't understand what you do anymore. Therefore, we are going to vote for leaders who are going to send you to war more often because we don't know you, you're not one of us, you're not our sons, our brothers, our dads, our daughters. So when you go to war, it doesn't affect us. And you could see sort of the, the shift on their faces like, oh my God, yeah, we're going to get sent to war a lot more because there's no consequences for the voters voting to send us. When you say insulated, do you mean like basically this cast of – is? A generational, like, my grandfather was a soldier, I'm Well, a soldier. it's becoming more and more, especially now that there's more women in the army, women are in combat. And the truth is, you're, ha you're having these soldiers who are coming back from combat, and America has no concept of who they are, what they do, what they went through. I mean, imagine you go to war in the Middle East, and for oil, let's, let's just be honest, it's for oil. It's, it's the 1979 Carter Doctrine that we signed with the Saudis that said, we will back up Saudi oil with military support. And that's, that's all out in the open. So you go there, you're fighting in Iraq, maybe you're on the ground quietly in Syria, maybe you're somewhere else, and then you come home and you see people driving Escalades. No concept of where the oil comes from, oil prices, and then they have a, a bumper sticker that says, I support our troops. How? Right. You know, in World War II, supporting your troops meant buying war bonds, paying a war tax, rationing. Maybe you had someone going to war. Maybe quitting your job and working in vital war work. So war touched you. And so when our soldiers came home, they knew, okay, these people, they didn't suffer the way we suffered, but they were affected. Whereas here, if you want to tune it out, 16 years of conflict, you could totally do that. How do these people feel? Who are you going to marry? Who understands what you went through? So soldiers really can only marry other soldiers or people from military families. And then their kids grow up on bases in the military culture and the, the gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so do you think it's possible to, to <clears throat> narrow that gap? Oh, totally. Totally. I think one of the best things we did without realizing a few years ago was ending Don't Ask, Don't Tell because it brought ROTC back on campuses. And so it allowed regular millennials to mix with 21st century soldiers who were their age and they say, oh, they're not that much different than we are. No, and honestly, some of the greatest notes I've ever gotten from people either on through email or Reddit or whatever are from, from uh, soldiers yeah. who said, you know, I, uh, I was in Iraq or I was stationed somewhere. I listened to the podcast or I used to watch G4 and I, you know, I loved playing this game. And, right. You know, and, and so <clears throat> it, was, it was such a – and I guess in my ignorance – I, you know, the first time I would get these, they're like, oh, they're just like us. You know, like I actually right. – the fact that I wouldn't have that thought 
and not just know like yes of course these are young people who are over there they want to you know they especially want to be able to escape and have ties back to home I mean escape mentally oh, yeah. have ties back to home feel some sense of normalcy you know like have connections the way and and I always wa- was particularly uh, I always felt a particular affinity or I was particularly touched by those correspondences. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I think <clears throat> this is what I, I've said to the Army all the time. I've said that you're not making your message known, particularly in popular culture. Uh, you know, I've worked on all these military bases and I meet gay soldiers and I meet Muslim soldiers and I meet s- soldiers, sailors, Marines of every ethnicity. I was on an aircraft carrier where the assistant chaplain was a Wiccan. I don't see any of these stories. You know, all I see are large Vikings uh, who look nothing like me, who would be nothing like me, and the military is sort of cast in this weird stereotype that you're that the only reason you'd go in the military is you're too poor, you don't have a choice. Modern Family just made fun of that. They just had a joke about that. Remember Luke, he couldn't get into college, and then the mom goes, well, maybe you'll join the army. Right. And so that's the stereotype. You're either too poor or dumb to do anything but join the army or you're some crazed redneck that likes to blow things up right that though that's the narrative and that's not what i see anywhere uh a marine who i've worked with in his spare time was a roadie for the punk band x oh wow whenever he went on leave he joined up with x on the road that's incredible i never see that guy in a movie all i see is arlie ermy well (laughs) all (laughs) <laughs> who reminds you that he's not your mother. Right. And that's it. But uh, but one of these days, some kid's going to be like, you are my mother. And he's going to yeah. be like, I got to rethink my whole strategy. <laughs> but, I, but I also think that um, uh, the depiction of, you know, I think people think of military people, especially because so, I feel like there's not an, enough uh, cinema, not enough entertainment. I look sort of like what you were talking about that depicts – the very human side of it because I think it's just easier in a film to like, oh, this person's one-dimensional and right. this character, you know, this character maybe feels a little bit of pain but they still got they still got to get in there and do their job and they don't really, you know, like it, they live it. And rather than just saying like, hey, these are people and they have emotions and they process things the way you process things and it's very human and not easy and not, you know. Oh, yeah. I mean, one of the major problems now that's affecting combat troops, one of my colleagues at West Point has written about is Facebook. Uh, he was on patrol and there was an ambush and uh, some Iraqi kids got killed. And, and what soldiers have been doing since the days of Rome is they go back to their barracks and they process it as a team, as a family. Well, they all went back and they all went on Facebook. They all retreated into their own little bubbles and they didn't bond over this and process this. And that is horribly destructive to unit cohesion, especially under combat. You have to know these people like you know yourself because you're literally your life is depending on them. So my colleague is trying to write about this. So – Screen addiction is not just for young people in the civilian world. It's also for soldiers who've grown up with this. Sure. So, you know, the military, if you're, gonna, if you're making a movie and you're using military facilities, there is actually an embedded officer that goes over your script that makes sure that you're not doing anything offensive to the military. And I said to them, why don't you use that embedded officer for a positive role instead of just a negative one? Instead of just using him as a censor, why don't you sit down with the writers and the producer and say, hey, would it be so wrong to make one little mention – of a character who has beaten PTSD, or you can have gay characters, you can have Muslim characters, you can have someone who puts on a dress if they're a dude in their spare time. That's okay. Right. You know, because it's, because we forget the military. Klinger. Yeah. Ed Wood. Mm-hmm. Ed Wood apparently was on Tarawa, the most brutal island fighting since Iwo Jima. And I think he did it in women's underwear. Oh, wow. I think that's, that's a, I don't know if that's an urban legend or I actually saw it in an interview. But Dana Gould could tell you that because Dana Gould is the, probably the foremost Ed Wood expert. Dana should tell us this because I've heard this. Ed Wood the Marine. Wow. And so when you're doing all the, how often do you go on speaking engagements? Well, I, because of West Point, I have to write an article for them at least once a month and lecture at the point at least twice a year. Mm-hmm. So I just – I lectured there a few months ago about creativity and the challenge uh, of championing creativity because I said to these cadets, you don't have to have the brilliant idea. Somebody will. What you have to have is the courage to get behind that brilliant idea and champion it even if it means you getting passed over for promotion. Wow. And you know what? This actually goes back to the other thing before about – Everyone getting a participation trophy, which is very destructive to creativity. Right. Because creativity, part of the creative process is putting your 
heart and soul out there, and it a lot of the time is going to get stomped on, you know, particularly with social media or just the way that we engage with things now. And uh, I, you know, then I sort of worry like, was well, that going to make people less eager to put themselves out there or to take a chance because they sort of feel like, hey, if I don't feel safe 100 percent of the time, I'm just not going to fucking do this thing because I don't oh, know how yeah. to process. Which the goes, backlash. goes exactly back to why I think Minecraft is so genius because what it does is it gives nice. you a chance to live your life the way you want, but then you get to test out that life choice up against real adversity. You know, sure. If you say, okay, here's how I'm going to gather food. Here's how I'm going to build my house. Here are the tools I'm going to make. Here's what I'm going to do. And then you put it out there and then you realize, oh. My house doesn't stand up to creeper explosions or <laughs> wheat takes a lot longer to grow than I thought or, oh, maybe I should make my tools out of heavier materials other than just wood. Right. Then you realize, okay, the life choices I've made, I need to adapt. And what I think is also brilliant about Minecraft, which I don't think they intended, was the game changes every six months. You know, I used to hate that. I, used to, I was playing Minecraft with my son. And everything was awesome. I knew what I was doing. And then the game would change. And then there were new creatures. And then suddenly I could use my left hand and I could use a shield. And then the monsters were harder to kill. And at first I was like, you mother... I was so mad. And then I realized, you know what? When the world changes, you have to change with it. Right. And that's a perfect metaphor for life. And I put that in the book. Because let's face it, the people who elected Trump are people who were left behind by change. The world changed and it left them behind and they didn't know what to do. And so someone came along and promised a time machine to a time when their skill set was worth something instead of what has to be done, which is you have to change your skill set. And I think the best lesson we can give our kids is you have to be adaptable. And Minecraft totally trains you for that. Right. Well, I mean, just talking about adaptability, look how many industries were either crushed by yeah. the digital era or how, how many – I was just reading today. I don't know how accurate a statistic this is, but it's something like, you know, just, just a headline. I'm not deep diving into the story, so I'm sure you'll correct me. But something about, you know, on the order of uh, $70 billion of devaluation in other companies that Amazon has created <clears throat> by, you know, like by going in and, and either absorbing something or mastering something. It's like, oh, now they're going to start doing a Geek Squad thing. And so, yep. you know, Best Buy's – on paper value went down a billion dollars because I mean you know this is all like trading value but but I still uh, you see it in companies I mean you look at but a that's company. not wrong that's no not wrong it's just change that, that's the change of the world I mean you see it in something like Netflix which built its whole business model on mail order DVDs right and then suddenly they were like nope new technology digital let's just throw it all out now they could have not done that they could have held on. And they would have gone under and been replaced by something else. So they adapted. Whereas something like Kodak, what? They had 20 years to say, oh, film is going away. Or Radio Shack. What happened? What happened to Blockbuster? <laughs> I mean, how did Blockbuster not adapt? Uh, and I think that's what we got to teach our kids is like boys and girls and everybody in between and everybody – How no matter how you identify yourself – the world don't care. Also, falling down and being hurt, not too severely, no. but falling down and being hurt is how you learn. Oh, that's exactly – I mean there's – like for parents, you have a book like The Blessing of the Skin Knee, which is like let your kid experience moderate failure, which is I think what's great about Minecraft is it's low consequence, sure. low risk, but high lesson. Yes. So like if a kid builds an incredible house on Minecraft and it gets blown up – and he or she cries, you go, okay, now you've learned the lesson. And you got to learn it without being 50 years old and having your real house burned down. Are you playing along with him like in a split screen or are you playing yeah, in another yeah. room? We, we've, we've linked our computers together and we're yelling at each other. And, oh, gotcha. And sometimes like the other day he ate a puffer fish. <laughs> I turned around. I look at him. He's sick. And I'm like, what did you do? And he's like, I ate a fish. I'm like, did you eat a puffer fish? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And I'm like, why? He's like, well, I didn't know. I'm like – Ask me, <laughs> which, by the way, is a great life lesson for checking labels on food. I wish I had asked you before I ate that puffer fish in real life. Yeah, literally, I, I'm like, son, this is a great – you've just learned a life lesson, which is when you go to the fridge, there's expiration dates. Look at them. They're there for a reason, <laughs> just like that puffer fish. Don't eat it. 
And so you, are you – is there a structure right now that you're particularly proud of that you're working on? Yes. Um, my son and I have colonized a whole island. Basically everything in the book I've played. There's okay. not one thing in that book that did not – that's why I didn't say it as a joke where I say this is based on true events. Is it, is it a fictionalized story or is it, is it more of like a – No, it's – I mean the character wakes up underwater and swims to an island and the character knows that they are from our world. OK. Uh, but doesn't know who they are in that world. So it is a story. It like, is an actual novel. Yeah, you know, yeah. I mean this is, a, this is Robinson Crusoe. Based on Minecraft. Yeah. Oh, and, that's fascinating. And what I thought was so brilliant about Robinson Crusoe, I read it again recently, which we tend to forget. It's not the survival aspect of it. It's the fact that the actual character Robinson Crusoe is an upper middle class brat who's never done anything for himself. Mm-hmm. That's the genius, is that he doesn't know how to wipe his own ass. And then he becomes a Green Arrow. Yeah. Suddenly he's on an island and he's like, whoa, I have to do everything for myself. And that was the story that, that I loved. And so in this story, the person doesn't know who they are and they have to learn how to survive in this brand new world. And as they're learning to survive, they're essentially raising themselves. Oh, wow. So how does it end? Do you want to just give away the ending right I, now? I won't give away the ending, but, okay. I, but what I will say is that at the end of the story, this character learns that the most important thing that they have crafted is you. Now I'm going to have to read this. So this person realizes they are crafting themselves. Oh, so it's like Minecraft. Exactly. Ah. And so basically it's just a simple Minecraft survival story with an added pinch of self-awareness. So every time our character accomplishes a goal, meets a challenge, uh, gets knocked down, they take a moment and realize, oh, I've just learned a life lesson. Now, um, check me if I'm wrong, but do you think a uh, Jewish person should write a book that's really close to Mein Kampf? Or is that... Oh, yeah. No, no, no. My struggle. Okay. <laughs> This is, this is definitely my struggle. <laughs> okay. Like, I right. cannot believe I that he believe. would say that why because – why? Because maybe he's like anti-Semitic. Maybe we don't know what the – but I think it's an amazing – I mean I, I've always been delighted by Minecraft, but I've always been too afraid to – Go down the the what I would call the dark path of my addiction. Oh, I I'm addicted to personality too, which would be <clears throat> oh, because did... I I kind of need a game. Like I was obsessive about Zelda. Oh my god! F- for probably 200 hours, and then I completed pretty much everything, with the exception of a few things, but enough where I felt like it was completed. And now I know the DLC came out, but I but to have a game that just never ends. Is very scary. Oh, it's to me. very dangerous. If I were single, oh my god, I, I, I don't know what would happen. I mean, I look. I'm the kind of guy that when I get into a video game, I go so deep. Yeah. When I was when I was in junior high, I used to play Silent Service on my Apple II GS, and I'd switch off the lights in my room, and then when the sub got hit, I would turn on the hot shower so the steam and the water would go everywhere. <laughs> And then I would I would crash dive to the bottom of the ocean and be like, well, I'm locking the door to my room and I'm going to sleep here until the Japanese destroyer has passed. Wow. That's how deep I go. Yeah. When I was in my 20s, I had Civ 2, Civ Myers, mm-hmm. Civ 2. And they had an editor on it where you could essentially craft your own game. Yep. So I crafted – a World War I strategic zombie game where I invented the zombies from the ground up, which then became the template for World War Z. Wow. Wow. Because of that, we got World War yeah. Z. So I go deep. So I, I was playing Minecraft for years with my son and figuring it out. I went to my son's principal at his old school and I'm like, dude, you've got to have a Minecraft life skills course because they're already playing the game. They're already loving it. Just – let them see it from a slightly different lens. And the teacher wouldn't do it. And so I was so frustrated. And then finally when I was approached, they, somebody said to me, do you have a take on a Minecraft book? And I was like, oh, do I ever. Oh, that's fantastic. But now I want to ask you about zombie physiology. Oh, yeah. So. Which, the- by, the, by the way, zombies in Minecraft, exactly the way I picture them. They never stop. See, the other creatures in Minecraft... You can outrun. You outrun them and then eventually they get tired of you and they're like, whatever, you're not worth it. Zombies 
keep coming. So I feel like whatever sort of biological agent or whatever sort of biological directive that is affecting their brain, which I imagine is probably not dissimilar to the thing that, you know, it's like, oh, the caterpillar gets a virus, the virus yeah. and it makes its head swell up and then a bird eats it and then the bird shits that out, virus out, and another, and then a, you know, a bottom feeder eats that. And, and then, then Gwyneth a, Paltrow touches it and suddenly you've got con- contagion. That's all, that's all yeah. it is. But, uh, but I'm wondering, because it seems to me that if you're a zombie, the big, one of the biggest things that you have to overcome is decay or rigor mortis. Because if you start to freeze up, obviously you can't really move because your tissue is dead and right. still disintegrating. And so does it stand to reason that maybe part of their biological directive is to consume fresh human blood because it helps keep their musculature limber so that they can ah. keep <clears throat> moving to, you know, it's like when they're swallowing the blood, it instinctively just somehow keeps their more it increases their mobility uh, to be so able to keep marching forward to spread this virus to uh, the far see i've never heard that one before i see, think i just thought of it i think you just but did some, someone's gonna tell me that someone else thought oh of it. i'm sure someone please oh my god <laughs> my attitude always was that the food was a byproduct of the biological need to eat which was a remnant in the brain see my imagination was when the virus hijacks the human brain it needs a way to spread the virus. So how will it spread the virus from one body to another? Right. Because it's not airborne. And so therefore, it hacks in the subconscious genetic human need to feed. So the food itself does nothing. It's the biting that it is using to transmit the virus. Sure. And I always imagine that zombies, they don't essentially rot as much as fall apart. Uh, because the virus is so toxic to anything that it's not turning that most of the bacteria uh, that would rot us don't go anywhere near us. Right. Because that's all – I mean you see zombie movies or TV or what, whatever. You see zombies rotting to which my attitude is like – or you see zombies drawn with flies around them. And I thought, dude, if that were true, if flies buzzed around zombies, then they would lay eggs. The maggots would hatch and they would eat the zombie to the bone sure. in like two days. Right. I mean, to this day, forensic experts use maggots to eat away flesh so they can look at bone structure. Right, right, right. So the only way you could keep all that stuff away is if the flesh is toxic to everything. And so do you then think – I mean because there obviously must be a certain point. There must be a tipping point where it disintegrates so much where they just can't function right. anymore. And what would happen my, in my imagination is as they disintegrate – uh, they would fall apart. They wouldn't be able to be mobile anymore. And then what would happen is the virus in the brain would eventually either be severed or it would die. And then the flesh would eventually decompose. Gotcha. But it's much – take much longer than it would uh, for a human body. And do you subscribe to the idea that it uh, – that the virus is, can jump – Species, or do you just feel like it's a no? Because I feel if you do that, th- then you're doomed. Right. I feel like it's toxic to species. I feel like I feel like the zombies would want to eat everything. Mm-hmm. But I also feel like if you're running from zombie squirrels and deer and and everything else, uh, and also if it can jump species, then let's be honest. Then mosquitoes would bite a zombie. They'd get the virus. It would go airborne. We'd all be zombified within a few days. Right. 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 That'd be it. Yeah, right. and that goes against. The whole philosophy of my zombie books, which is the slow creeping, stoppable dread, uh, which is the scary one. You must have liked It Follows then. Did you see It Follows? No. It Follows is a horror movie that came out maybe two years ago. Amazing soundtrack too. But the whole idea is that it is a uh, it is a sexually transmitted demon, for lack of a better word. So, oh boy. So you have so you basically let's say you have the virus. Right. In order to get rid of this demon, you have to have sex. You have to have unprotected sex with someone. They again then get the demon, and what happens is they start seeing, kind of in their peripheral vision or something, just this being that just slowly moves at them and never stops. And they can't, you wow. know, so they run, but then they notice it's just still coming. And then so once they die, if it kills yeah. them, then it goes, it reverts back to the person that gave, gave it to them. And then the demon like focuses on them. So it's basically just wow. trying to get rid of this sexually trans. I mean, it's a, and it does give you that scent. And even though I told you the plot, it's not a oh. spoiler. It's like, it sucks it's sort for of what's Tinder under, 
<laughs> I know Tinder, but it's just the idea that, you know, it's the thing that never, it, I guess in a way it, it does seem to be stu- steeped in zombie lore in that now, way. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wasn't there a 1970s David Cronenberg movie similar to that? Uh, which movie? I can't remember, but where they essentially become zombified by doing it. Let's find out. Yes. David Cronenberg, IMDb. Let's go to the phones. Shivers. Oh, shivers. Residents of a suburban high-rise apartment building are being infected by a strain of parasites that turn them into mindless, sex-crazed fiends out to infect others by the slightest sexual contact. Boy, you know... Bam. It's so funny. I don't know if I remember this movie, but I certainly remember the VHS box... And then also wondering, you know, when I was renting movies, if there was an accept, if you have to strike that balance between this seems like enough of a real movie that my parents will let me rent it. Right. But I really want to see uh, sex. I know. So, you know, so it's not, it's like you got to find that habitable zone. Oh, yeah. No, I mean. Uh, like, no, it's just a horror movie. There just happens to be sex. No, it's no, not no. a sex movie. No, it's essentially like living in a communist country where you're like, no, 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 sir. No, there's no capitalism in this movie. There's nothing There's nothing <laughs> Western or counter-revolutionary at all. Not at all. It's a metaphor. Right. But no, for sir. For how capitalism is bad. Yeah. And that we must uh, live for the c- commune. And that that's how we lived as teenagers. Like, no, no, mom. I'm t- no, it's the Terminator. It's the Terminator. No, Fast Times is about people... High school people and just and understanding a social structure that is uh, built on social hierarchy and and oppressive and, and say no to drugs, kids. Say no to drugs. Look what look what and also use protection. Right when because look what happens because there's teen pregnancy. Jennifer Jason Lee's character and Damone, that little prick. Right, you know. So that's horrible, okay. horrible stuff. Actually, I was really lucky. My parents didn't have any. As I assume yours didn't, but my parents never had any real restrictions on what I was... I mean, obviously, I couldn't, like, watch an X-rated movie. But as far as R-rated comedies and R-rated movies, like, I was allowed. Well, my parents went out, so I used to sneak in and watch movies on cable. And that was the golden age of PG-13. Sure. So Stripes, Police Academy, there was always a shot of something. Yeah, but those movies... Stripes was not PG-13. Stripes, I think, might have been just straight R. Oh, it might have been R. Because I think think Red Dawn was the first PG-13 movie. Oh, yeah. And that was mid-80s. But I do, uh, but I do remember that the yeah comedy was a great way in comedy and no, horror. It's a comedy, were, yeah, yeah, it's comedy. We're no, talking about mom. It's it's Blue Thunder. It's a helicopter. It's, yeah. it's Roy Scheider in a helicopter. What could possibly be dirty about that? Listen, there are some boobs in it, but it's just for the international market. Yeah. It's not, you know. I understand a lot about how these films get financed, and so it doesn't. Don't worry about it. It's yeah. Don't, don't worry, Dad. I'm not going to get a girl pregnant. I know. Well, my <laughs> my parents were really cool because I'd watch like Stir Crazy or something, and like uh, oh. Or like 48 hours, yeah. you know, which my dad gave me. Uh, and then there'd be boobs. And my parents kind of had this like, well, my dad was totally fine with it. My mom would sort of pretend like it, like, well, ah, whatever. You know, like it was that kind of, I think, you know, my parents, just don't tell other parents that I let you watch this. My parents were freaked out, I think, by the world. Because remember, my parents are greatest generation. Right. And I'm a Gen Xer. So there, there's no baby boomers in between. I think... When you have baby boomer parents, it's still sex, drugs, and rock and roll for them. Fuck, you're right. When I, you just really realize when I have kids, it's going to skip a generation. Yeah. Damn. And so it's going to be weird because the world's going to be so different as it was for my parents. My parents were like, oh, my God. Like, they didn't understand sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yeah. And so it really weirded them out about anything I was into. You know, my dad's like, what are you listening to? Is it going to make you a drug addict? I'm like, Dad, it's Wang Chung. <laughs> it's not going to make me Is a drug that a drug name? Yeah. It's not going to make me a drug type of heroin. It's that type of heroin. Yeah. Tell me this. Are you doing Wang Chung in there? Everybody Wang Chung tonight. Are I get you, it. Are you snorting Wang Chung? <laughs> I don't think you snort Wang Chung. Just yeah. P.S. Are you Are you shooting Wang Chung? Or are you You're shooting Wang Chung? Is there Wang Chung in your mouth? Did you see the uh, Did you see um, feud Betty versus Joan? I heard my mom is in it. She is. <laughs> my God. Yes, because. Uh, Joan Crawford goes around and tries That's to get right, and basically says like because she wants to get on stage in front of Betty Davis. I want to see that because I- I'll I, accept your Oscar for you. I heard the woman who plays my mom is she was in Tron Legacy. I think she was Michael Sheen's. Wasn't Michael Sheen's second banana? The the woman who introduces Sam Flynn. Listen, I've seen the original Tron a hundred times. I saw I Tron know. Legacy once. I know, me too. 
Maybe. So I, I, I would love to be able to tell you, but I just. But uh, I will I say, my my mom's been on my on my mind a lot because when I was when I was a kid in seventh grade, my mother took me to see the Miracle Worker at my school at Crossroads. Okay. Because she was in the Miracle Worker. She right. was Annie Sullivan. So we're watching it, and it's good, and my mom's enjoying it. It's a school play. And then there was one kid who had a minor role, and my mother suddenly grabbed my hand, and she said, he's really good. And for my mom to say that, that was rare. And she said, I, I'm going to keep my eye on him. That was Jack Black. Hey! <laughs> did you ever tell Jack that story? I did. I did. You know, Jack and I went to high school together. We I don't think I knew together. that. Jack and I... We're in the Caucasian chalk circle together. He was in 11th grade. I was in 9th grade. <laughs> and so my mother was always like his benefactor. She was always pushing him and saying, you know, you're amazing. And nobody knows this about Jack. He's Brando. You know, he kind of went the tenacious D route, but he's one of the greatest dramatic actors in this country right now. And I don't know if the world will let him be that, but when you saw him on stage, you were like, oh my God, my mom used to take us to UCLA to see him in plays. Even after he had graduated Crossroads. And it was almost a curse that he was so funny and, mu- and musically talented. Yeah, it's amazing. So that's why when I was doing the audiobook for Minecraft and I saw the list of potential people, I thought, are you kidding me? Jack does, Jack does audiobooks? So we just wrapped it. That, uh, he did your audiobook? Two people. We wanted to do a male version and a female version so nobody would feel left out. So we got Samira Wiley. From Orange is oh, the New Black. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. We get some... I was like, oh, God, I don't know who to do for a woman. I'm so surprised that you didn't do it, considering no, 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 that you I'm, did voiceover. I'm not... Well, you know why? Here's the thing. Why? I'm, because I'm super dyslexic. It would have taken me a month. Oh, gotcha, 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 So gotcha, we needed gotcha. a man and a woman. My wife said, what about Samira Wiley? She was amazing. And then when Jack signed on, I brought my son, and we had an awesome teaching moment in the booth watching him. Because according to Jack, he's a little bit dyslexic and his tongue is too big for his mouth. (laughs) So my son, who's like worship Jack, is watching him grind it out. You know, there's stops and starts. He's like, ah, shit, I got to do that better. Okay, hold on. Let me do this again. And he would do it again. And he would do it again. And I would say to my son, look how hard he's working. This is one of the biggest, most talented actors in the universe and look that he still has to work at it. Yeah. And I want my son to know that. I want him to, to feel that deep in his bones. It doesn't matter if you're talented. Talent is 10%. The other half is you got to break some rocks. you got to right. work. And so I want him to see his hero, his idol, Jack Black, pounding it out. And never forget that moment. I'm looking up the uh, actress who played your mom, and I'm trying to find... You know, I stand by my decision when I saw Tron Legacy. I want more Bruce Boxleitner. I like Bruce Boxleitner. I love him. Oh, my God. I was such a Babylon 5 fan. And, you know, I got him to read on World War Z. Oh, that's great. <laughs> because of Tron? Yeah. Uh, and because well, of Babylon 5. Babylon 5. I'm literally at a, at a Comic-Con once, and he came up, total Mr. Gentleman. And he was like, hey, um, is this is this uh, World War Z? And, I'm, and I was like, yes, sir. And I look up and I'm like, oh my God, it's Captain Sheridan. <laughs> and he's like, oh, can I, can I buy a copy for my son? He would love that. And I'm like, oh, sir, sir, it's on the house. He's like, no, 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 no. Here, here you go. You're not coming up? No. I mean, she, it had to have... Sorinda Swan. Sorinda Swan. Sorinda Swan as Anne Bancroft. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe she wasn't in Tron Legacy. Oh, it says she was in Tron Legacy. Aha! And Percy Jackson. So what was it? Uh, was it just that she was in Tron Legacy? Is that what you... That's how I knew. Because I remember looking her up and I thought, oh, who played my mom and what else has she done? And I saw Tron Legacy and I thought, oh, good. She's done something sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Because, you know, I mean, as, as the big dork that I am, we just watched that show Will that just premiered last uh-huh. night. Young Will Shakespeare. Right. And it's interesting and I'm watching it. And then I'm watching the head of the theater troupe. And suddenly it's Cole Meany. And I'm oh. like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's O'Brien. Mm-hmm. And it's O'Brien. And, you know, my wife's like, who's that? And I'm like, it's Chief, Chief O'Brien. O'Brien. And then, of course, my wife says what she always says, which is, oh, this is one of your little Dungeons and Dragons things. That's so funny that it gets categorized in that. Everything to my wife is Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Does not matter what it is. It is Dungeons and Dragons. Well, uh, yeah, I would love to hear what you think about the, the about Betty and Joan. It's really... I'm going to have to check it out. It's pretty fun. 
I think pretty I, spectacular. I think I told you years ago that my wife, she's in a theater company, and she said, oh, um, so I've hired this woman to read stage directions, one of the theater, one of the troupe. She's really great. Uh, you may know her. Her name is Denise Crosby. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god, I Tasha I, Yar! I literally started running around the house. I'm like, Tasha Yar! Oh my god! Oh my god! Can I meet her? I turned it to Ed Grimley. Oh my god! I'm so excited. My heart is beating. I mean, I can't even believe it. I mean, God, can you just believe it right now? I'm Maybe being... Tasha Yar and I could be friends. I mean, Tasha Yar of all people, can you just even believe it? Did you ever? Do you remember the? You remember the Ed Grimley sketch where his dad comes in and it's Howard Cosell? Oh my god! <laughs> what are you doing to my son? I must say. <laughs> <laughs> that fucking was such a great you needed to have Howard Cosell's entire life happen in order to make yes. that comedy moment as golden as it absolutely was the great moments when you get guest stars who really have no business being there and it's the best and they're the best John McCain was the best host I think we had the season when I was on SNL because he would do anything and we had him singing Barbra Streisand songs <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, yeah, and then at first you're like, what, what the fuck is he doing? And then he turns to the camera and goes, you know, f- for decades, Barbara Streisand's been trying to do my job. So I thought I'd try hers. Oh, that's great. It was brilliant. That's fun. And uh, do you miss that writing schedule? Not a bit. Got it. Well, because, you know, I'm not a collaborator. You know, they always say adversity introduces you to yourself. And when I was there in the writer's room at SNL, I realized, like, this is not me. The only time I ever wrote anything good is when I could sneak away into the records room and lock myself in and hide. I'm a solitary guy. You know, I was a, an only child growing up in my room, mm-hmm. playing with my G.I. Joes. And that was my world. And that's my world still when I write. Uh, like, my dad, that would be a death sentence. Like, the only way my dad could ever sit down and write a book is if he killed someone in a DUI and his community service was to write a book. <laughs> <laughs> you have to sit in a room alone for six months and write. But it has to be government ordered in some yes, way. because that's the only way he's going to do it. Yeah. Whereas me sitting in a room with other people and kibitzing back and forth, I'll never get any work done. I, I have to be alone and just write. I feel like I said this to you last time, but I really have to connect you with Will Wheaton. I think you guys would love each other. We met, we met at your birthday. Oh, that's right. He's amazing. I mean, the fact that he was a child actor and to do what he did when he was that young and the fact that he isn't sitting somewhere with a heroin needle you right. know, in his arm, the fact that he's like actually made a life, mm-hmm. statistically, uh, that's, that's unicorn town. <laughs> he's amazing. <laughs> Good. Okay. I'm glad you guys are friends. He's, he, yeah, very surprisingly cool. And uh, listen, I don't want to... I don't want to bug you about it, but, you know, since you offered, if your dad wanted to sign the Dark Helmet... Well, I think you're going to have to come down to the office and do this. I think maybe, you know, if you... If you and listen! And I think you're going to have to do it quickly because in a month he's leaving for Europe for Young Frankenstein, the musical that is opening up in the UK. Oh, my God. So I think we're going to have to schedule something quick. I will absolutely... <laughs> I'm glad that's not where you I was very worried where you were going with that. No, no, no. You better do it quick. Yeah, because it, he went to the doctor. No, he's fine. He's completely healthy. He that, just had what, 90? He just turned 91. Oh, my gosh. He just turned 91, if you can believe it. And he loves to play Minecraft. No. <laughs> Not so much a Minecraft. No, I mean, just now, you teaching me how to do Twitter, that was me teaching my dad how to use the dimmer on the light switch in our house. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So every generation has to do that. Next time you come on the podcast, I'll teach you how to retweet with a quote. Oh, my God. It's a whole new world out there. (laughs) It's amazing. I can't believe he would say these things. I am so delighted to be friends with you and to have you come on the podcast. And you're you're just involved in so many fun, amazing, incredible things that are interesting and good for humanity. And also, but the idea that you could, you know, listen to uh, books about counterinsurgency and then go, well, I'm going to I'm going to write a Minecraft book. Well, get this as far as schizophrenia. Uh, in a week, I have to go to Singapore for a national security conference, international security conference about sort of where the world is going. Yeah. And, and I will be chairing one of the panels about uh, global trends. So I have to do that. Then I have to get on a plane and fly directly to Comic-Con. 
to launch the Minecraft book. Oh, that's fantastic. But you know what? They're completely tied together. What I do at West Point is exactly what I'm doing with Minecraft because at West Point, I am studying how complex and crazy and ever-changing the world is, and Minecraft is going to teach our kids how to survive it. Fantastic. A great way to wrap up the podcast. Max Brooks, I just can't believe you are here. It was so great to have you in my house, I must say. My heart is beating. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> we went through all of them. <laughs> Which, by the way, I still loved your tweet about Paul Ryan looking like Pee Wee Herman. About Paul Rudd? Paul Ryan. Oh, Paul Ryan. Remember you? you oh, that's right. You there tweeted was a that. Of Paul Ryan, I think, next to Joe Biden. Yes. And I, yes, and I compared him to Pee Wee and Joe Biden to Amazing Larry. Yep. Who was one of my all time favorite characters in cinema. I mean, besides Pee Wee, I mean Amazing Larry, because we learn nothing about Amazing Larry. We just know he's <laughs> Amazing Larry. I mean, it's, it's fucking incredible. Yeah. And I, I don't know if I ever need to know about Amazing Larry. I just love that there's an Amazing Larry. The things that we love. The next time I come on, we're going to delve deep into deconstructing the movie The Last Dinosaur okay. with Richard Boone yep. from the 1970s. That's how obscure we're going to get. Do you watch Rick and Morty? I, I've watched – oh my god. No, I watched one – and this is a big problem. When you're doing, uh, uh, doing a talk and you're away from home and you're jet lagged, don't try Ambien and watch Rick and Morty. No, I think don't try Ambien and dot 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 is a it, good general. It I, I can't I can't do it. I'm not I think a, there is no and. After no, the I'm not a drug person. I tried yeah. it again at another conference, and I woke up the next morning with a giant bruise on my knee, and I don't know how that happened, and I'm very scared. Well, no, you have to skin your knee sometimes. Well, That's the thing learn. is, I said to my wife, I'm like, well, my anus doesn't hurt. So, <laughs> in fact, it feels really good. Yeah. So I literally I took an Ambien. I'm like, okay, I'll try it. You know, it works for people. And then I started to get really loopy, and the Rick and Morty episode came on where. It's a simulation in a simulation in a simulation. Uh huh. Which, by the way, oh my God, I can't believe I'm not, I didn't tell you this. Okay. National Security Conference in Sea Island, Georgia. Cybersecurity, state of the world. I'm tired. I go home, ambient, I get loopy. Your show is on. What? Your I'm, talk show. I'm in, oh, I'm in a talk show. Talk yes. To your, your talk show is on, and I'm literally wondering to myself, is this really happening? <laughs> or am I just a part of your... Because there uh, was a Yoda reference in it. That sounds... It was two weeks ago. Yeah. It was about two weeks ago. And I'm thinking to myself, like, okay, you know what? We're taking a moment here. I'm going to check this out. Did you make a note of it? Yes. I made a note of it as I was loopy with the Ambien. This is, by the way, this is the next morning I woke up with the knee injury. And I thought to myself, you know what? Melatonin. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with melatonin. I think that I think that's going to work. Melatonin helps. I think melatonin is going to work just fine because I I ain't going, I ain't going on there anymore. Where is it? I, I love that you made a note of this. I literally did. I think I even initially was going to text you, and then I thought, you know what? I don't know what I'm saying or doing. That explains all those pictures of your butthole I got. Uh, oh, I can't text. find the note. But let me tell you, because I never did drugs. I'm not a drug person, and this is my problem. You know, I've learned that the key to drugs is is starting early. <laughs> kids. It's too late for me, kids. It's too late. I already have a set way that I process the world and you know I cannot what? have that. And I think dyslexia kept me off drugs because I was literally like, wow, I'm holding on by my fingernail stone sober. The way that it the way that it is. Yeah. I'm like the way my brain is without the drugs, I'm barely hanging on. Well, uh, oh, I should tell people the book is called Minecraft the Island. And is it out now or is it coming out? Uh, it is coming out in a week on the 17th. It's available for pre-order right now. And today was the first day the audiobook went up. Fantastic. Well, thanks for being here, Max Brooks. Thank you, my friend. Enjoy your burrito, everybody. <laughs> now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. <laughs> This episode of the Nerdist Podcast is brought to you by Vice Principals on HBO, starring Danny McBride as Neil Gamby. After getting shot by a person wearing a mask, a warrior mask, Gamby returns with a vengeance. Gamby's search for his killer and vendetta to find the person who shot him leads him to suspect everyone he surrounds himself with, including his inner circle. But what you should know is that Vice Principals is a fucking hilarious program. Tune into the season premiere Sunday, September 17th at 10.30 p.m. only on HBO.
directly to Comic-Con to launch the Minecraft book. Oh, that's fantastic. But you know what? They're completely tied together. What I do at West Point is exactly what I'm doing with Minecraft because at West Point, I am studying how complex and crazy and ever-changing the world is, and Minecraft is going to teach our kids how to survive it. Fantastic. A great way to wrap up the podcast. Max Brooks, I just can't believe you are here. It was so great to have you in my house, I must say. My heart is bleeding. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> We went through all of them. <laughs> Which, by the way, I still loved your tweet about Paul Ryan looking like Pee Wee Herman. About Paul Rudd? Paul Ryan. Oh, Paul Ryan. Remember, you... you oh, that's right. You there tweeted was a that. of Paul Ryan, I think, next to Joe Biden. Yes. And I... Yes, and I compared him to Pee Wee and Joe Biden to Amazing Larry. Yep. Who was one of my all-time favorite characters in cinema. I mean, besides Pee Wee, I mean Amazing Larry, because we learn nothing about Amazing Larry. We just know he's <laughs> Amazing Larry. <laughs> I mean, it's it's fucking incredible. Yeah, and I, I don't know if I ever need to know about Amazing Larry. I just love that there's an Amazing Larry. The things that we love. The next time I come on, we're going to delve deep into deconstructing the movie The Last Dinosaur. Okay, with Richard Boone yep. from the 1970s. That's how obscure we're going to get. Do you watch Rick and Morty? I I've watched. Oh my god, no! I watched one, and this is a big problem when you're doing uh, uh doing a talk and you're away from home and you're jet lagged. Don't try Ambien and watch Rick and Morty. No, I think don't try Ambien and dot 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 is a it good li- general. It lit- I, I can't. I can't do it. I'm not I think a- there is no and. After no, the I'm not Ambien. a drug person. I tried yeah. it again at another conference, and I woke up the next morning with a giant bruise on my knee, and I don't know how that happened, and I'm very scared. Well, no, you have to skin your knee sometimes. Well, That's the thing learn. is, I said to my wife, "I'm like, well, my anus doesn't hurt." So, <laughs> in fact, it feels really good. Yeah. So I literally, I took an Ambien. I'm like, okay, I'll try it. You know, it works for people. And then I started to get really loopy, and the Rick and Morty episode came on where. It's a simulation in a simulation in a simulation. Uh huh. Which, by the way, oh my God, I can't believe I'm not, I didn't tell you this. Okay. National Security Conference in Sea Island, Georgia. Cybersecurity, state of the world. I'm tired. I go home, ambient. I get loopy. Your show is on. What? Your talk show. No, a talk show. Talk Yes. Your, your talk show is on, and I'm literally wondering to myself, is this really happening? <laughs> or am I just a part of your... Because there uh, was a Yoda reference in it. That sounds... It was two weeks ago. Yeah. It was about two weeks ago. And I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, you know what? We're taking a moment here. I'm going to check this out. Did you make a note of it? Yes. I made a note of it as I was loopy with the Ambien. This is, by the way, this is the next morning I woke up with the knee injury. And I thought to myself, you know what? Melatonin. <laughs> There's a- I mean, she it had to have... Sorinda Swan. Sorinda Swan. Sorinda Swan as Anne Bancroft. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe she wasn't in Tron Legacy. Oh, it says she was in Tron Legacy. Aha! And Percy Jackson. So what was it... Uh, was it just that she was in Tron Legacy? Is that what you... That's how I knew, because I remember looking her up, and I thought, oh, who played my mom, and what else has she done? And I saw Tron Legacy, and I thought, oh, good, she's done something sci-fi. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Because, you know, I mean, as, as the big dork that I am, we just watched that show Will that just premiered last uh-huh. night, Young Will Shakespeare. Right. And it's interesting, and I'm watching it, and then I'm watching the head of the theater troupe, and suddenly it's Cole Meany. And I'm oh. like, oh, my God! Oh, oh my God, it's O'Brien! Mm-hmm. And it's O'Brien! And, you know, my wife's like, who's that? And I'm like... It's Chief Steve O'Brien. O'Brien. And then, of course, my wife says what she always says, which is, oh, this is one of your little Dungeons and Dragons things. That's so funny that it gets categorized in that. Everything to my wife is Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Does not matter what it is. It is Dungeons and Dragons. Well, uh, yeah, I would love to hear what you think about the, the about Betty and Joan. It's really... I'm going to have to check it out. It's pretty fun. I think pretty I, spectacular. I think I told you years ago that my wife, she's in a theater company... And she said, oh, um, so I've hired this woman to read stage directions, one of the theater, one of the troupe. She's really great. Uh, you may know her. Her name is Denise Crosby. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. I Tasha I, Yar? I literally started running around the house. I'm like, Tasha Yar! Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Can I meet her? I turned it to Ed Grimley. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. My heart is beating. I mean, I can't even believe it. I mean, God, can you just believe it right now? Maybe, Maybe Tasha Yar and I could be friends. I mean, I'm Tasha gonna... Yar, of all people, can you just even believe it? Did you ever? Do you remember the? You remember the Ed Grimley sketch where his dad comes in and it's Howard Cosell. Oh my God! What are you doing to my son? 
I must say. <laughs> that fucking was such a great... You needed to have Howard Cosell's entire life happen in order to make yes. that comedy moment as golden as it absolutely was. The great moments when you get guest stars who really have no business being there. And it's the best. And they're the best. John McCain was the best host I think we had the season when I was on SNL because he would do anything. And we had him singing Barbara Streisand songs. <laughs> And then he said, yeah. and at first you're like, what, what the fuck is he doing? And then he turns to the camera and goes, you know, for decades, Barbara Streisand's been trying to do my job. So I thought I'd try hers. Oh, that's great. It was brilliant. That's fun. And uh, do you miss that writing schedule? Not a bit. Got it. Well, because, you know, I'm not a collaborator. You know, they always say adversity introduces you to yourself. And when I was there in the writer's room at SNL, I realized, like, this is not me. The only time I ever wrote anything good is when I could sneak away into the records room. and. Okay, there you are. Okay, here we go. Yeah, maybe you know, maybe update your phone. Maybe turn. Maybe how do you not have two-factor authentication turned on? You read a bunch of shit. You- I know. Please, it, my wife says if it was up to me, I would still be driving into the valley to check my my answering machine. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, this is Jim Rockford. Leave a message at the beep. Okay, you are on. Uh, you are now on the Wi-Fi. This should. Tweet, and there you go. It's out. 23 seconds ago. Wow. Look at that. These things are amazing. This, I think this is going to catch Th- on. This, this is technology. wonderful, this, this tweetering thing. It's just, <laughs> Offensive oh. wow. So, oh, I wow. cannot believe. I can't believe wow. Wow, that you would, you would do anything ethnic. Hit Hitler on ice, wow. That's... Oh. <laughs> oh my God, can you imagine my dad tried to make it today? <laughs> There are so many things about History of the World Part 1 or Spaceballs, right? Just people will be like, that would, wow. Yeah. Yeah, that would get a lot of wows. People, I, I just can't believe you said that. Yeah, or Blazing Saddles. or And without oh even sort of God. realizing, and I think what's offensive about being mad about that is, un, is when you understand where Mel was coming from. Yes. Having been through the war, having, you know, lived through a time of the Holocaust, having lived through, you know, being a Jewish American and... You know, it's like, yeah, comedy is how you process the horrible, yeah. horrible shit pile of the world. And as he says, he's, he's, as my father says so brilliantly, Hitler's main weapon was terror. It was fear and intimidation. So ridiculing so him turn makes him, into him a, smaller. Right. You turn him into a clown and then you take the mickey out of him. Right. And that's why neo-Nazis never came up after the war in this country because they're a joke. Right. And so, I mean, same thing with Blazing Saddles. You're making fun of the racists. You're not – can you understand that? You're not being a racist. Right, 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 right. Yeah, when he was on the podcast, he talked about that and working with Richard Pryor. Right. I mean, it was just absolutely incredible. And did he say that where Rockridge came from, the town of Rockridge? No. Came from Lawton, Oklahoma, where he was stationed in the Army, in the field artillery in World War II. Oh, wow. He did his artillery training in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He'd never been out of Brooklyn other than to go to VMI. And, you know, he gets off a train. He he doesn't think these stories are interesting. I think they're amazing. Jewish kid from Brooklyn, never been south, gets off a train in Virginia, hot as hell, goes to a drinking fountain, starts to drink. Cop comes by and says, hey, boy, you you don't drink there. And it said coloreds only. So he he was drinking at the wrong drinking fountain. He didn't know about Jim Crow. He didn't know about segregation. Sure. And he didn't – he didn't know – was he white or colored or as a Jew, where does he... He didn't understand what, yeah. his, what his cultural identity was. Right, because in the South, it was very clear. There were no Jews. Someone's aunt. It's like a current That's how journal. I would explain it to my mom. She'd be like, well, it's a blog. And I'd be like, it's like a journal. It's a web blog. Anyway, Squarespace will help you create anything you want with beautifully designed templates, customizable features. Creating a beautiful website is simple and intuitive. Just add and arrange your content with the click of a mouse. Start your free trial today at squarespace.com. Enter the offer code NERDIST to get 10% off your first purchase uh that is squarespace.com offer code nerdist so uh let's talk about the nerdist community cork board which are uh, I, I things that you can send to events at nerdist.com that are of relevant to your interest from the nerdist community yeah this guy sent in he didn't write his name but he said he recently or she actually because no name again write your yeah. names people hey man broaden your gender horizons uh, Katie. <laughs> 
I just recently released a new game, and I thought the Nerdist community might like it. Asymmetric Games just released a slapstick comedy Wild West adventure role-playing game called West of Loathing. You basically think of it as stick figure Skyrim, but with beans and big hats. The Onion called it one of the funniest games in ages. The Guardian listed it as among the funniest video game of all time. So you can find it at westofloathing.com. I would play something just based on the idea of stick figure Skyrim. I know, right? With beans and big hats. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm very intrigued by that line. I don't know what it means, but I like well, that's it. That's why you should go play it. Find out. <laughs> I also want to remind people that we have lots of podcasts on the network, like the Jackie and Lori show with Jackie Cation and Lori Kilmartin, Half Hour Happy Hour, uh, Bizarre States, Cashing In with TJ Miller, Pro You, Love Alexi, The Todd Glass Show. We have so many. You can find them at Nerdist.com, and you can subscribe and uh, rate and review them on iTunes, too, if you'd be so inclined. Fantastic. Uh, also, I have some stand-up dates coming up at uh, Acme in Minneapolis at the end of September, and also for the New York Comedy Festival at Caroline's in New York at the beginning of November, uh, the American Comedy Company in San Diego. Lots of stuff. Uh, so that's all coming up, and uh, I don't have those listed anywhere. Shit. Now, I used to list that stuff at Nerdist, but it's not. It's weird to do that now because, yeah. you know, Nerdist isn't like my personal blog anymore. My yeah. personal weblog anymore. Your personal journal. My personal current journal <laughs> uh, for your mom. This episode is Max Brooks, a dear friend of mine whom I adore, one of the smartest people I know. Uh, Max Brooks is promoting Minecraft the Island, which is his book, available now wherever books are sold. But uh, he's just the fucking best. And the first time Max was on, people went nuts over his episode. Yeah. He's so he's so smart. And, and it's really interesting, the stuff that he's into. and the, the This book was fascinating, the way he was talking about it. Yeah. So uh, pick up the book. Enjoy this Max Brad, uh, Brooks podcast return. And then uh, Max will just come on. Uh, <laughs> I think we need to get Max on like once a year. We just need to have him back on as often as possible. Uh, so that's Max. Uh, this episode also brought to you by Stamps.com. Uh, getting to the post office sucks. You know, larger, more global economies are where you're talking about, you know, it, that you it doesn't quite work that way, that there has to be a distribution process. And even during – even when they're fucking – even during debates, during presidential debates – you know, like when when Bernie was a, a, a potential contender, of course, and uh, and you know he was saying, "Oh, I want to tear down this, and we want to give all these people." And it's like, you know, I think who's going to pay for that? And I think I think people had this idea in their minds, and I'm not meaning to disparage him in any way. I mean, he seems like a lovely guy, but I just wanted to say to some people, like, there's not going to be a money parade like in Bat in, in the original Batman, right. where all this money is just going to start coming. Like, it. I think it probably even costs a lot of money to figure out how to use the money properly yeah. and it's a little more complicated that and I, again I'm not oversimplifying I mean I don't mean to oversimplify what he was saying I, but I just I, I think it's much more complicated than people understand oh, no. and it's not just like <clears throat> fucking write a check right just write him write a check and I think the major problem is that we are four we are now four generations out from the great leap forward we had in 1945 you know, the greatest generation understood how systems work. They understood what it took to keep the lights on, the water running, the sewage pumping. They understood how complicated a hospital was because they didn't grow up with hospitals. All the things that we grew up with and we take for granted, yeah. just like the generation before us took it for granted. You right. know, we're th we are Gen X, baby boomers, millennials. We all think this stuff just happens. Right. We don't understand that in 1945, this country literally jumped into the modern world. And our great grandparents were like, oh, no, no, this takes a lot of planning and preparing and money and training and education. And so therefore, since we don't understand how our own civilization works anymore, we are flummoxed why we can't just build it overnight in Afghanistan. Right. And when you read – if you read anything from like the 1930s and you see what – it's really fascinating to see uh, how minuscule the United States military oh, God, uh, yeah. presence was where you just – you know, you, I remember seeing some sort of a scale where it was like today's military presence and it was measured by, you know, each little soldier cartoon represented, you know, 10,000 people. And there was barely any in like 1930, 1931. But uh, – but the greatest generation, also kind of racist, little racist well, generation. Well, they didn't call it racist or sexist or homophobic. <laughs> they, they just called it living their lives. They just called it living their lives. They, but they did do they did do a lot of stuff. You know, they I feel like they did. There are lessons to you know, good lessons to learn from them if you try to ignore all of. I mean, if you scoop that stuff away. But but just the idea of how to 
think about maybe think about money but then of course after the war this sort of after world war ii this like oh there's there's prosperity and now and i can understand the idea of you know we want to give our kids the baby boomers we want to give them yeah the uh, oh, uh, pick up the book enjoy this max Brod, uh, brooks podcast return and then uh, max will just come on uh, <laughs> i think we need to get max on like once a year we just need to have him back on as often as possible uh so that's max uh, this episode also brought to you by Stamps.com. Uh, getting to the post office sucks. It's, it's not it's not enjoyable in any way. No one likes going to the post office. I mean, unless you live in a small town where you're the only person who goes in the post office yeah. and maybe it's run by your friends. But for <laughs> most people, going to the post office is an assy experience. So avoid the hassle of the post office and mail everything from postcards, envelopes, to packages, domestic or international with Stamps.com. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail. You click print mail, you're done. You hand it to your postal carrier. And unlike the post office, it never closes. Uh, 24-7, they're going to send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage and help you decide the best class of mail based on your needs. So right now, you too can enjoy the Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in NERDIST. That is Stamps.com. Enter the promo code NERDIST. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. And now here's the NERDIST podcast, episode number 902, with Max Brooks returning and Katie rolling the thing. Now entering NERDIST.com. I brought Neil deGrasse Tyson's book, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry, next to your book because something has happened with books lately where the covers have gotten oh my God, really right. satisfying to touch. Look They're at this. very tactile and very. This actually, and it's the same color scheme. Yeah. It's so I, I thought that yeah they seemed they seemed like wow. cousins they seemed Look, like little it buddies. It is true. Uh, Katie, I the, want you to. That's the most satisfying. No, like, it's it's basically like if we're going to spend money to make a book, it better be nice. <laughs> I mean, people don't hold books in their hands that often anymore. No. Uh, do you read book books or do you read on Kindle? I read – it depends on what I have to read. Okay. <clears throat> like if I have to do stuff for West Point, there's no way I'm reading a counterinsurgency manual. Okay. I have to listen to it. I understand. I have to do Audible for like the big heavy text – but for fun, yeah, no, for fun, <laughs> it's, I'm always just reading, you know. But who, who reads those types of books out loud? Oh, not enough soldiers, I'll tell you that. But Audible has an incredible amount. Die, six, I live. That's a good number. Also, yeah, we just play the number, you know, we play the numbers. Also, just, you know, we need to, uh, it's a difficult to find a good babysitter. So we're going to make a babysitter so we to just, babysit the younger kids. The first one, a babysitter, the last one, and the Pope said, no, 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 you, you, you leave that in there. You leave that in there. <laughs> then you call out the Lord's name and you make a new baby. I can't believe Chris and Max would talk about making social change and then do these offensive accents. I am offended. This is horribly offensive against Italian Americans. Wow. Just wow. That's always my favorite. Song. Wow. Yeah. Just wow. There's going to be a lot of wow. Wow. Yeah, I know, because I'm sure I sound like an idiot talking about uh, political infrastructure. But uh, I, this is an interesting <clears throat> point that you have to bring up the fact that you've just joined Twitter like days okay, ago. Okay, all right. Can you please teach me about this? I'm an old – I mean basically we want to talk about stereotypes. Matt Brooks, author on Twitter. Hello. I I'm, I'm just joined the Twitter. By the way, so, you're great with voices. Why are, Why did you not do more you know, like well, comedy performance? Well, you know I used to do cartoon voices. Did I? I don't know if I did know you, that. Batman Beyond? Oh, come on. Did I not know this? Yeah, Howard Groot. Oh, shit. I was Terry McGinnis's like, dorky friend. This is amazing. So by day, you're doing cartoon voiceover, and by night, you're writing about uh, by, counterinsurgency. Well, no. By day, if we're talking about cartoon voices, by day, I was doing Batman Beyond. This is 1999. By night, I was scribbling away at a little book that I thought no one would ever read called Zombie Survival Guide. I've, I've heard of this before. Yeah. Is there some sort of a world war that would come out of that? Apparently, not only was there a world war, some guy with awesome hair then saved the world on screen. You know, can I say you do I, – I would, I would buy you as a, as a Dick Grayson – type 
I could I could have been I could have totally been Dick Grayson. I could have been Terry McGinnis. They wouldn't let me. It was that Will Friedel because he had a job before. Oh yeah, Will, of course. Yeah, who was awesome. But it's cool. I got to hang out with him, and I got to sit next to Kevin Conroy. I mean, who anything he says is cool. I mean, really like the definitive Batman, Kevin and, Conroy. And, and they literally would be like, "All right, we're going out for lunch. Kevin, do you want anything?" He'd be like, "I'll get a Whopper Junior." <laughs> <laughs> So what did you want to see? What do you want me to look at on Twitter? Okay, tw- I will you teach me how to use Twitter because I'm I'm literally this is the telegraph for it's me. Very simple. You get mad about something and you write in all caps. What's hard about that? <laughs> so I just did it, and how does it work with retweeting and tweeting other people and and following and and I, I'm completely ignorant. So all right, so let's say I decide to put something out there. Okay, you teach me how to use Twitter. All right, yes, and I want to write uh, say. On Nerdist Now with Chris Hardwick. Okay. What do I do? <clears throat> you would, uh, I don't want to do it for you because All I right. want you to be able to learn. All right. So yeah, teach me how to do so it. So you open your little dialogue box oh. there. You open Which, your little dialogue box. It's the, it's the quill. So that's a writing box, not a dialogue box. I'm sorry. It's a writing box. Okay. So here we are. Yes. What, it says, what's happening? That father is trying to keep his kid off drugs, but the grandfather is Pablo Escobar. Of course. Yeah. I can understand how that would be. Yeah. <laughs> I've often thought of Mel Brooks as the Pablo Escobar of comedy. He kind of is. And so I'm, it's hard to tell my son, no, you can't say that. And he'll say things like, well, Dad, if black people call each other the N-word, why can't we call each other the K-word? I said, no, you, you just can't. You he's, just like, can't. he's like, well, why don't we? I'm like, because we don't. He's like, well, what if I started a trend? I'm like, please, please don't. don't. Start, please don't start a trend. That's not a trend please, to start. Please don't do that. And so does your dad... Enc- I would assume he encourages this. Kind yeah, of- we got in a huge generational fight a couple of years ago when he was doing. My son was doing Notable Americans. Mm-hmm. He was going to be FDR, okay. so he wanted to do it as FDR a polio comedy. <laughs> <laughs> So and he had a whole routine. He had a whole Looney Tunes routine of FDR suddenly getting eye polio and rolling off a cliff. And I said, "No, you, you can't. can't do that." And so Henry's like, "Why?" I'm like, "It's just wrong." He's like, "But Dad, nobody in the audience has polio anymore." And I said, "Just trust me on this one." And Grandpa said, "What? It's funny. You should let him do it. FDR a polio comedy." Did you let him do it? No, <laughs> absolutely not. Well, you know what's good is that. If you were the comedy person, it would be very difficult to justify. Yes. So at least you're sort of the buffer between the two. But I also sort of feel like maybe there are some <clears throat> maybe there are some places where you let him do that stuff, and if it doesn't fly, then he kind of learns. Well, what we do is is we have to ration out inappropriateness. Sure. Like when we went – a few months ago, we went camping on Santa Rosa Island, just the two of us. And we okay. told each other ghost stories. He told me his little ghost story. And I told him the story of The Thing. Okay. John Carpenter's yep. The Thing. And he was so excited, not because of the scariness, but because it had bad words. Right. So I said to him, okay, if you – don't mouth off in class and don't get sent to the principal's office for the whole rest of the year. At the end, I will let you watch that last scene of Kurt Russell confronting the thing and saying what he says to the thing. And he's like, really? And I'm like, okay, just remember that every time you're about to do something, that's going to get in your trouble. And sure enough, clean slate. Wow. So we showed him the last 30 seconds of the thing. Did Was, did, was he like super excited or did he feel like yeah. it was worth behaving he all that time? He was very – for – to see Kurt Russell, who he had just been introduced to from Guardians of the Galaxy. Sure. To see Kurt Russell say, yeah, well, fuck you too. Yeah. To a giant alien, that's worth it. That was worth it for the rest of his, that yeah. made his year. So now I got to find something else wildly inappropriate. <laughs> You're going to, you might, you might, you might, and now that he's about to hit puberty, you might have to up it to like Pornhub categories. Yeah. He's, he, thank God the hormones have not kicked in yet. Zelda. Oh my God. F- for probably 200 hours. And then I completed pretty much everything with the exception of a few things, but enough where I felt like it was completed. And now I know the DLC came out, but I, but it, to have a game that just never ends is very scary. Oh, it's to very me. dangerous. If I were single, Oh my God, I, I, I don't know what would happen. I mean, I, look, I'm the kind of guy that when I get into a video game, I go so deep. Yeah. When, I was, when I was in junior high, I used to play Silent Service on my Apple II GS. And I'd switch off the lights in my room. And then when the sub got hit, I would turn on the hot shower so the steam and the water would go everywhere. <laughs> 
And then I would, I would crash dive to the bottom of the ocean and be like, well, I'm locking the door to my room and I'm going to sleep here until the Japanese destroyer has passed. Wow. That's how deep I go. Yeah. When I was in uh, my 20s, I had Civ 2, Civ Myers, mm-hmm. Civ 2. And they had an editor on it where you could essentially craft your own game. Yep. So I crafted a World War I strategic zombie game where I invented the zombies from the ground up, which then became the template for World War Z. Wow. Wow. Because of that, we got World War yeah. Z. So I go deep. So I, I was playing Minecraft for years with my son and figuring it out. I went to my son's principal at his old school and I'm like, dude, you've got to have a Minecraft life skills course. Because they're already playing the game. They're already loving it. Just let them see it from a slightly different lens. And the teacher wouldn't do it. And so I was so frustrated. And then finally when I was approached, they, somebody said to me, do you have a take on a Minecraft book? And I was like, oh, do I ever. Oh, that's fantastic. But now I want to ask you about zombie physiology. Oh, yeah. So. Which, so- by, the, by the way, zombies in Minecraft, exactly the way I picture them. They never stop. See, the other creatures in Minecraft, you can outrun. You outrun them, and then eventually they get tired of you, and they're like, whatever, you're not worth it. Zombies keep coming. So I feel like whatever sort of biological agent or whatever sort of biological directive that is affecting their brain, which I imagine is probably not dissimilar to the thing that, you know, it's like, oh, the caterpillar gets a virus, virus and it makes its head swell up, and then a bird eats it, and then the bird... Shits that out, virus out, and another, and then a you know a bottom feeder eats that, and, and then, then Gwyneth it. Paltrow touches it, and suddenly you've got con- contagion. That's all. That's all yeah. it is. But uh, but I'm wondering because it seems to me that if you're a zombie, the big one of the biggest things that you have to overcome is decay or rigor mortis. Because if you start to freeze up, obviously you can't really move because your tissue is dead and right. still disintegrating. And so does it stand to reason that maybe part of their biological directive is to consume fresh human blood because it helps? The kids got killed. And, and what soldiers have been doing since the days of Rome is they go back to their barracks and they process it as a team, as a family. Well, they all went back and they all went on Facebook. They all retreated into their own little bubbles and they didn't bond over this and process this. And that is horribly destructive to unit cohesion, especially under combat. You have to know these people like you know yourself because you're literally your life is depending on them. So my colleague is trying to write about this. So screen addiction is not just for young people in the civilian world. It's also for soldiers who've grown up with this. Sure. So, you know, the military, if you're, gonna, if you're making a movie and you're using military facilities, there is actually an embedded officer that goes over your script that makes sure that you're not doing anything offensive to the military. And I said to them, why don't you use that embedded officer for a positive role instead of just a negative one? Instead of just using him as a censor, why don't you sit down with the writers and the producer and say, hey, would it be so wrong to make one little mention of a character who has beaten PTSD? Or you can have gay characters, you can have Muslim characters, you can have someone who puts on a dress if they're a dude in their spare time. That's okay. Right. You know, because it's because we forget the military. Klinger. Yeah. Ed Wood. Mm-hmm. Ed Wood apparently was on Tarawa, the most brutal island fighting since Iwo Jima. And I think he did it in women's underwear. Oh, wow. I think that's, that's a, I don't know if that's an urban legend or I actually saw it in an interview. But Dana Gould could tell you that because Dana Gould is the, probably the foremost Ed Wood expert. Dana should tell us this because I've heard this. Ed Wood the Marine. Wow. And so when you're doing all the, how often do you go on speaking engagements? Well, I, because of West Point, I have to write an article for them at least once a month and lecture at the point at least twice a year. Mm-hmm. So I just I lectured there a few months ago about creativity and the challenge uh, of championing creativity. Because I said to these cadets, you don't have to have the brilliant idea. Somebody will. What you have to have is the courage to get behind that brilliant idea and champion it, even if it means you getting passed over for a promotion. Wow. And you know what? This actually goes back to the other thing before about – Everyone getting a participation trophy, which is very destructive to creativity. Right. Because creativity, part of the creative process, is putting your heart and soul out there. And it a lot of the time is going to get stomped on, you know, particularly with social media or just the way that we engage with things now. And I, you know, then I sort of worry, like, was well, that going to make people less 
eager to put themselves out there or to take a chance because they sort of feel like, hey, if I don't feel safe 100 percent of the time, I'm just not going to fucking do this thing because I don't oh, know how yeah. to process Which the goes, backlash. Which goes exactly back to why I think Minecraft is so genius because what it does is it gives nice. you a chance to live your life the way you want, but then you get to test out that life choice up against real adversity. You know? sure. If you say, okay, here's how I'm going to get that, they could have held on. And they would have gone under and been replaced by something else. So they adapted. Whereas something like Kodak, what? They had 20 years to say, oh, film is going away. Or Radio Shack. What happened? What happened to Blockbuster? (laughs) I mean, how did Blockbuster not adapt? Uh, And I think that's what we got to teach our kids is like boys and girls and everybody in between and everybody, how no matter how you identify yourself – the world don't care. Also, falling down and being hurt, not too severely, but no. falling down and being hurt is how you learn. Oh, that's exactly – I mean there's – like for parents, you have a book like The Blessing of the Skin Knee, which is like let your kid experience moderate failure, which is I think what's great about Minecraft is it's low consequence. Sure. Low risk but high lesson. Yes. So like if a kid builds an incredible house on Minecraft and it gets blown up – and he or she cries, you go, okay, now you've learned the lesson. And you got to learn it without being 50 years old and having your real house burned down. Are you playing along with him like in a split screen or are you playing yeah, in another yeah. room? We, we've, we've linked our computers together and we're yelling at each other. And, oh, gotcha. And sometimes like the other day he ate a puffer fish. <laughs> I turned around. I look at him. He's sick. And I'm like, what did you do? And he's like, I ate a fish. I'm like, did you eat a puffer fish? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. And I'm like, why? He's like, well, I didn't know. I'm like – Ask me, <laughs> which, by the way, is a great life lesson for checking labels on food. I wish I had asked you before I ate that puffer fish in real life. Yeah, literally, I, I'm like, son, this is a great – you've just learned a life lesson, which is when you go to the fridge, there's expiration dates. Look at them. They're there for a reason, <laughs> just like that puffer fish. Don't eat it. And so you, are you – Is there a structure right now that you're particularly proud of that you're working on? Yes. Um, My son and I have colonized a whole island. Basically everything in the book I've played. There's not one thing in that book that did not – that's why I didn't say it as a joke where I say this is based on true events. Is it it a fictionalized story or is it it more of like a – No, it's – I mean the character wakes up underwater and swims to an island and the character knows that they are from our world. Okay. Uh, but doesn't know who they are in that world. So it is a story. It like, is an actual novel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is a, this is Robinson Crusoe, based on Minecraft. Yeah. Oh, and, that's fascinating. And what I thought was so brilliant about Robinson Crusoe, I read it again recently, which we tend to forget. It's not the survival aspect of it. It's the fact that the actual character Robinson Crusoe is an upper middle class brat who's never done anything for himself. Mm-hmm. That's the genius is that he doesn't know how to wipe his own ass. And then he becomes a uh, green arrow. Yeah. Suddenly he's on an island and he's like, whoa, I have to do everything for him. I think this stuff just happens. Right. We don't understand that in 1945, this country literally jumped into the modern world. And our great grandparents were like, oh, no, no, this takes a lot of planning and preparing and money and training and education. And so therefore, since we don't understand how our own civilization works anymore, we are flummoxed why we can't just build it overnight in Afghanistan. Right. And when you read – if you read anything from like the 1930s and you see what – it's really fascinating to see – uh, how minuscule the United States military oh, God, uh, yeah. presence was, where you just, you know, you, I remember seeing some sort of a scale where it was like today's military presence, and it was measured by, you know, each little soldier cartoon represented, you know, 10,000 people. And it, there was barely any in like 1930, 1931. But, uh, but the greatest generation, also kind of racist, little racist well, generation. Well, they didn't call it racist or sexist or homophobic. <laughs> they, they just called it living their lives. They just called it living their lives. They, but they did do they did do a lot of stuff. Corre- you know, they, I feel like they did. There are lessons to you know, good lessons to learn from them if you try to ignore all of. I mean, if you scoop that stuff away. But but just the idea of how to think about maybe think about money but then of course after the war this sort of after world war ii this like oh there's a there's prosperity and now and i can understand the idea of you know we want to give our kids the baby boomers we want to give them 
yeah. the a comfortable life that we didn't have because a lot of us were right. immigrants or a lot of us had to work and, you know, crawl into factory chimneys. And we want them to – but then, you know, so the baby boomers get cushy. My generation gets cushy, you know. And we get cynical. We say, what's it all about? We look at the baby boomers. Well, because basically we grew up in the wake of the baby boomers' disaster where they started out idealistic. We're going to change the world. And then don't trust anyone over 30. And then they turn 30. Mm-hmm. And then they said, ah, screw it. Let's just buy a whole bunch of shit and vote for Ronald Reagan. Yuppies. And we grew up in the shadow of that. And we thought, oh, well, I guess revolutions don't happen. And ideals don't mean anything. And suddenly you've got Christian Slater and pump up the volume going, you know, just don't know what's popular anymore. All right. Just, so you got Rubens and you could go to parties as Christian Slater. I could. You could, I, be, you could I, be a Christian Slater party club. I could read a counterinsurgency manual hey, as Christian kids. Slater. Who so likes a poodle when you're diffusing an IED? Remember, <laughs> cut the red wire, not the blue. And then you have millennials who basically just are staring at themselves all the time. Well, that's our fault. I blame, I blame all millennials' problems on us because we never taught them anything. We never said, kids, you don't get a trophy for showing up. Right. And you're not awesome. You can do awesome things. Katie is a big supporter of this point, by the way, of like giving everyone a participation trophy and I'm, I'm, of, of not giving one every, everyone a participation trophy. from the 80s. <laughs> we didn't do that. I was right before. Well, it doesn't – it does not teach – it does not give you a skill set if you don't understand how to overcome – No. Uh, I can't read from a prepared speech and I can't read from a cue card and I can't read from a teleprompter. So when I get up to talk – I sure shit better know what I'm talking about. Right. So I can never bullshit and I can never be busted on anything because whatever I'm talking about, I know it backwards and forwards. Well, and you also have to have an understanding of yeah. what you're saying. I have to have supreme confidence in the material that I'm speaking on. Right. I, I have to really understand it because there's always a Q&A after I speak. And if it's a prepared speech, I – who knows? What are common questions you get after your speeches? Well, uh, for the first time at West Point when I spoke, I talked about the dangers of creating a warrior cast. And a cadet asked me, he said, well, what's wrong with that? I said, what's wrong with it is we don't understand what you do anymore. Therefore, we are going to vote for leaders who are going to send you to war more often because we don't know you. You're not one of us. You're not our sons, our brothers, our dads, our daughters. So when you go to war, it doesn't affect us. And you could see sort of the the shift on their faces like, oh my god, yeah, we're going to get sent to war a lot more because there's no consequences for the voters voting to send us. When you say insulated, do you mean like basically this cast of – is a generational like my grandfather was a soldier, I'm <clears throat> Well, soldier. it's becoming more and more, especially now that there's more women in the army, women are in combat. And the truth is you're, ha- you're having these soldiers who are coming back from combat and America has no concept of who they are, what they do, what they went through. I mean, imagine you go to war in the Middle East and for oil. Let's, let's just be honest. It's for oil. It's, it's the 1979 Carter Doctrine that we signed with the Saudis that said we will back up Saudi oil with military support. And that's, that's all out in the open. So you go there. You're fighting in Iraq. Maybe you're on the ground quietly in Syria. Maybe you're somewhere else. And then you come home and you see people driving Escalades. No concept of where the oil comes from, oil prices, and then they have a a bumper sticker that says, I support our troops. How? Right. You know, in World War II, supporting your troops meant buying war bonds, paying a war tax, rationing. Maybe you had someone going to war. Maybe quitting your job and working in vital war work. So war touched you. And so when our soldiers came home, they knew, okay, these people, they didn't suffer the way we suffered, but they were affected. Whereas here... If you want to tune it out, 16 years of conflict, you could totally do that. How do these people feel? Who are you going to marry who understands what you went through? So soldiers really can only marry other soldiers or people from military families. And then their kids grow up on bases in the military culture, and the the gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so do you think it's possible to to narrow that gap? Oh, totally. Totally. I think one of the best things we did without realizing a few years ago was ending Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Because it brought ROTC back on campuses. And so it allowed regular millennials to mix with 21st century. So everybody feels good. Instead of actually having to do the real hard legislative grunt work and dig in and make sure there's social justice. I mean, the fact that there is a giant Twitter rant against Steve Martin for saying Carrie Fisher was beautiful when he first met her. Yeah, that was that was that was that was upsetting because it basically says it's basically being saying to to someone you're not allowed to you're not 
you knew this person. It's it's he lost right. a friend. Right. He lost a friend. He wasn't allowed to compliment her. Now that was a national outrage. Whereas every day in states across the country, Roe v. Wade is being turned back. Voting rights against African Americans is being pulled back. Where's that outrage? Where's the freaking Twitter rants of tens of millions of people freaking out? It's so much easier to say, oh my God, can you believe what someone said? Yeah. Who cares what they said? You know, personally, as far as last time I checked, Michael Richards is not in charge of a polling place or an abortion clinic. Right. He's a freaking comedian. Who cares what he said? What I care about is what people do. Right. And people are doing some really, really dark shit. And they're rolling back a lot of social progress in the dark. So you so you were of the mindset that a lot of people are being caught up in the minutia of uh, – with that, on the minutia of the way communication is happening, and not which does come from a good place, I assume, but not really taking the time to do the work to focus on this is how we enact, you know, like real. Yeah, I think everybody wants to be change. on stage doing the theatrics of social justice without doing the grunt work backstage. Right. You know, Samantha B had someone on her show, an old civil rights worker, and she made this wonderful speech about how. Civil rights for for all of the glory of the marches and Dr. King's speeches, there were millions of hours of people knocking on doors and getting sandwiches and filling out petitions. And there was just a lot of really unglamorous work. And I think for the first time in my life, I understand that old expression from before our time, the revolution will not be televised. I never got that. I was like, well, what does that mean? Of course it'll be televised. There's television. Now I get it. It means like, oh, don't expect to always be the hero in your own show. Sometimes you have to sweep up backstage to make good things happen. Right. And so is this some of the stuff that <clears> – <throat> is this any part of the stuff that you're writing now? Because the book – actually, it's kind of interesting because the, <clears throat> the book that you actually wrote was uh, Minecraft. You wrote a yes. Minecraft book. Yeah, well, the whole point for me of the book was when I discovered Minecraft with my kid, I realized, oh my God, this is the greatest single social teaching tool probably ever invented, ever. Because you're always trying to lecture kids on what to do. You're always trying to give them life tips and they're always rolling their eyes and they should. We didn't like to be lectured to. Nobody likes to be lectured to. Education should be fun. It should be interactive and you should own it. So how do you do that? Well, there's video there and my son gets to tell him inappropriate things yep. and then he goes to Carl's mm -hmm. and then he has dinner at Carl's like around nine yep. and then they stay up till about one or two. Yeah. Then he comes home and then the whole process starts over again. So we're just a way station because mm -hmm. he can't go to Carl's too early. Carl's not ready for him. Gotcha. 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 You're, you're a stop on the way to yeah. Carl. You're, you're really just, oh wow. Yeah. You're like uh Baker, California. We really are. On the way to Vegas. Yeah. You're basically the world's tallest thermometer with the yeah. the mad Greek. We're Barstow. Yeah. <laughs> you should open a factory outlet yeah. mall in Mel's your backyard. Mel's Barstow. <laughs> Mel Stow. Yeah, it's funny that you say that. How old is your son? 12. Oh, he's 12. Oh, okay. Because uh, my nephew is 18, and I've discovered that he also has a very inappropriate sense of humor, which, of course, I applaud. I just want to read you a little text exchange oh from right before you got here. Uh, I, I have a friend who is a germaphobe and only uh, bumps fists. And he says, he says, uh, please tell me you shook his hand. And I go, no, no one shakes his hand. He fist bumps you. And then he wrote back, did he fist you? And I go, oh. yeah, I misunderstood. So he put his fist in me by mistake, in quotes. And then he – and then I – so I think it's done. I think, okay. Yeah, I, you I've, zinged him. I've put the button on. But the one Mic drop. Oh, no. Then he writes – Hope he was wearing a glove. Everyone has to get the prostate exam at some point. And I write, now you tell me. Now I think it's done. Yeah, there and we go. And he writes back, it's not weird unless you clinched. Now I'm getting proud of him. I'm oh, like, okay, he's, he's really he's going deep on well, this. And so I to said, speak. I said, good tip, which is also what I told him. hey oh, And he said, another good tip is anal bleaching. Then it's sanitary. Now I feel like he went one step too far with the joke. You know, he went right. like one step too far. But... I am very pleased at his developmental uh, But you can progress. teach that. You, you, you can teach when to say goodnight, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, yeah, you, exactly. You can't teach will. No. <laughs> you can't teach the fire. I, can't, I can teach him like after three beats, it's done. Right. But, you know, it, uh, but, but it, but it is – but I love that – I'm very proud that his brain is working in that direction. Yeah, that's you, – you can't teach that. Like I, I can teach my son, you know, 
when to say things, when not to say things. But I can't teach him to love watching Roots, right? which is what he does every night. That's his favorite show now. Oh, incredible. So we have to sit there and watch the 1970s miniseries Roots, and he deconstructs it. That's incredible. Your son must be a genius. I I may not live to see his adulthood. He's going to be a great adult someday, but he's killing me. (laughs) Because he deconstructs it, too. And he says, says, Dad, so if Kizzy was raped by Master Moore, then how come Chicken George is darker than Kizzy? Oh, wow. Yeah, he goes that that. So deep. he's doing all of the cultural math. Uh, yes, it. and the genealogy. And I have to say to him, like, well, honestly, son, Ben Vereen was just who they cast. Right. And he happens to be darker than Leslie Uggams. So he was. So he's, de- he's deconstructing it as though it was a real that. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. My struggle. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is definitely my struggle. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it was like, I cannot believe I can't that he believe. would say that Why because... Would? Why? Because maybe he's like anti-Semitic. Yeah. We don't know what the... But I think it's an amazing... I mean, I, I've i always been delighted by Minecraft, but I've always been too afraid to go down the, the what I would call the dark path of my addiction. Oh, I, I'm addicted to personality too. Which would be... <clears throat> oh, because do- I, I kind of need a game like... I was obsessive about Zelda. Oh my god! F- for probably two hundred hours, and then I completed pretty much everything, with the exception of a few things, but enough where I felt like it was completed. And now I know the DLC came out, but I, but to have a game that just never ends is very scary. Oh, it's to very me. dangerous. If I were single, oh my god, I. I I don't know what would happen. I mean, I look. I'm the kind of guy that when I get into a video game, I go so deep. Yeah. When I was when I was in junior high, I used to play Silent Service on my Apple II GS, and I'd switch off the lights in my room. And then when the sub got hit, I would turn on the hot shower so the steam and the water would go everywhere. <laughs> And then I would I would crash dive to the bottom of the ocean and be like, well, I'm locking the door to my room and I'm going to sleep here until. The Japanese destroyer has passed. Wow. That's how deep I go. Yeah. When I was in uh, my 20s, I had Civ 2, Civ Myers, mm-hmm. Civ 2, and they had an editor on it where you could essentially craft your own game. Yep. So I crafted a World War I strategic zombie game where I invented the zombies from the ground up, <laughs> which then became the template for World War Z. Wow. Wow, because of that, we got World War yeah, Z. So I go deep. So I, I was playing Minecraft for years with my son and figuring it out. I went to my son's principal at his old school, and I'm like, dude, you've got to have a Minecraft life skills course because they're already playing the game. They're already loving it. Just let them see it from a slightly different lens. And the teacher wouldn't do it. And so I was so frustrated. And then finally when I was approached, they somebody said to me, do you have a take on a Minecraft book? And I was like, oh, do I ever. Oh, that's fantastic. But now I want to ask you about zombie physiology. Oh, yeah. So. Which, by the the way, zombies in Minecraft, exactly the way I picture them. They never stop. See, the other creatures in Minecraft, you can outrun. You outrun them, and then eventually they get tired of you, and they're like, whatever, you're not worth it. Zombies keep coming. So I feel like whatever sort of biological agent or whatever sort of biological directive that is affecting their brain, which I imagine is probably not dissimilar to the thing that, you know, it's like, oh, the caterpillar gets a... And I would say to my son, look how hard he's working. This is one of the biggest, most talented actors in the universe. And look that he still has to work at it. Yeah. And I want my son to know that. I want him to to feel that deep in his bones. It doesn't matter if you're talented. Talent is 10%. The other half is you got to break some rocks. you got to right. work. And so I want him to see his hero, his idol, Jack Black, pounding it out. And never forget that moment. I'm looking up the uh, actress who played your mom, and I'm trying to find... You know, I stand by my decision when I saw Tron Legacy. I want more Bruce Boxleitner. <laughs> I like Bruce Boxleitner. I love him. Oh, my God. I was such a Babylon 5 fan. And, you know, I got him to read on World War Z. Oh, that's great. Because of Tron? Yeah. Uh, and because well, of Babylon 5. Babylon 5. I'm literally at a, at a Comic-Con once, and he came up, total Mr. Gentleman. And he was like, hey, um, is this, is this uh, World War Z? And, I'm, and I was like, yes, sir. And I look up, and I'm like, oh, my God, it's Captain Sheridan. <laughs> and he's like, oh, can I, can I buy a copy for my son? He would love that. And I'm like, oh, sir, sir, it's on the house. He's like, no, 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 no. Here, here you go. You're not coming up? 
I mean, she it had to have. Sorinda Swan. Sorinda Swan. Sorinda Swan as Anne Bancroft. Oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe she wasn't in Tron Legacy. Oh, it says she was in Tron Legacy. Aha. And Percy Jackson. So what was it? Uh, was it just that she was in Tron Legacy? Is that what you? That's how I knew because I remember looking her up and I thought, oh, who played my mom and what else has she done? And I saw Tron Legacy and I thought, oh, good, she's done something sci fi. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Because, you know, I mean, as, as the big dork that I am, we just watched that show Will that just premiered last uh-huh. night, Young Will Shakespeare. Right. And it's interesting and I'm watching it. And then I'm watching the head of the theater troupe and suddenly it's Cole Meany. And I'm oh. like, oh my God. Oh. Oh my God, it's O'Brien. Mm-hmm. And it's O'Brien. And, you know, my wife's like, who's that? And I'm like, it's Chief, Chief O'Brien. O'Brien. And then, of course, my wife says what she always says, which is, oh, this is one of your little Dungeons and Dragons things. That's so funny that it gets categorized in that. Everything to my wife is Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> Does not matter what it is. It is Dungeons and Dragons. Well, uh, yeah, I would love to hear what you think about the, the about Betty and Joan. It's really... I'm going to have to check it out. It's pretty fun. And I think pretty I, spectacular. I think I told you years ago that my wife, she's in a theater company... And she said, oh, um, so I've hired this woman to read stage directions, one of the theater, one of the troupe. She's really great. Uh, you may know her. Her name is Denise Crosby. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God. I Tasha think, Yar? I, I literally started running around the house. I'm like, Tasha Yar! Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Can I meet her? I turned it to Ed Grimley. Oh, my God. I'm so excited. My heart is beating. I mean, I can't even believe it. I mean, God, can you just believe it right now? Maybe Maybe Tasha Yar and I could be friends. I mean, Tasha Yar, of all people. Betty versus Joan. I heard my mom is in it. She is. My God. Yes, because uh, Joan Crawford goes around and tries to get... That's right. And basically says, like, uh, just because she wants to get on stage in front of Betty Davis. I want to see that because I... I'll accept your Oscar for you. I heard the woman who plays my mom is... She was in Tron Legacy. I think she was Michael Sheen's... Wasn't Michael Sheen's second banana? The, the woman who introduces Sam Flynn. Listen, I've seen the original Tron a hundred times. I saw I Tron know. Legacy once. I know, me too. Me so too. I, I, I would love to be able to tell you, but I just... But uh, I will I say, my, my mom's been on my, on my mind a lot because when I, was, when I was a kid in seventh grade, my mother took me to see the Miracle Worker at my school, at Crossroads. Okay. Because she was in the Miracle Worker. She was Annie Sullivan. So we're watching it, and it's good, and my mom's enjoying it. It's a school play. And then there was one kid who had a minor role, and my mother suddenly grabbed my hand, and she said, he's really good. And for my mom to say that, that was rare. And she said, I'm going to keep my eye on him. That was Jack Black. Hey! (laughs) Did you ever tell Jack that story? I did. I did. You know, Jack and I went to high school together. I don't think I knew that. Jack and I... We're in the Caucasian chalk circle together. He was in 11th grade. I was in 9th grade. <laughs> and so my mother was always like his benefactor. She was always pushing him and saying, you know, you're amazing. And nobody knows this about Jack. He's Brando. You know, he kind of went the tenacious D route, but he's one of the greatest dramatic actors in this country right now. And I don't know if the world will let him be that, but when you saw him on stage, you were like, oh, my God. My mom used to take us to UCLA to see him in plays. Even after he had graduated Crossroads. It was almost a curse that he was so funny and, mu- and musically talented. Yeah, it's amazing. So that's why when I was doing the audiobook for Minecraft and I saw the list of potential people, I thought, are you kidding me? Jack does, Jack does audiobooks? So we just wrapped it. That, uh, he did your audiobook? Two people. We wanted to do a male version and a female version so nobody would feel left out. So we got Samira Wiley. From Orange is oh, the New Black. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. We get some... I was like, oh, God, I don't know who to do for a woman. I'm so surprised that you didn't do it, considering no, 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 that you I'm, did voiceover. I'm not... Well, you know why? Here's the thing. Why? I'm, because I'm super dyslexic. It would have taken me a month. Oh, gotcha, 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 So gotcha, we needed gotcha. a man and a woman. My wife said, what about Samira Wiley? She was amazing. And then when Jack signed on, I brought my son, and we had an awesome teaching moment in the booth watching him. Because according to Jack, he's a little bit dyslexic and his tongue is too big for his mouth. (laughs) So my son, who's like worship Jack, is watching him grind it out. You know, there's stops and starts. He's like, ah, shit, I got to do that better. Okay, hold on. Let me do this again. And he would do it again. And he would do it again. And I would say to my son, look how hard he's working. This is one of the biggest. (laughs) There's not a lot of hiding. (laughs) You know, we've... The men in our family, we have, we are multi-talented. There's a lot open to us, but yes. there's a lot of doors that are closed, mm-hmm. like Ninja, 
mm-hmm. you know, spy, riverboat gambler, anything that has sort of subterfuge yep. and stealth mm-hmm. is lost on sort of the Brooks men. I, I, I totally understood. Totally understood. So you would you would be a very poor spy. I would be a horrible spy. My dad would be a horrible spy. But I feel like because you said that, you'd actually be the perfect spy. If I could, if I could be like Claudius, you know, like I Claudius and sort of pretend to be a buffoon, but really be super smart. Yes. Uh, but no. But you're doing all this, in, all the, all this intelligence study. But it's all out in the open. There's, yes, but you're not picking anything up along the way? I have, but I haven't, like, no one's reading me into anything secret. Okay, okay. It's basically all this, it's basically all the stuff that everybody already knows, but no one's ever thought about. Gotcha. You know, it's the kind of thing where, like, I just wrote an article about North Korea, and one of their dangers is using an EMP, like in the Matrix. Right. And technically, is that an act of war? Because you're not actually hurting anyone by using an EMP. It's the secondary and tertiary. Yeah, reactions. it is, but but those there's but, no there's no legal framework. We could decide to go to war, but there's no legal framework that automatically triggers war. But to de-technify yeah. uh, a culture uh, is it's like a cyber attack. A tremendous amount of would be inflicting a tremendous amount of harm in the way that people do business. I mean, is yes, it's not. It maybe it's not necessarily. Well, it could kill people who are you know attached to uh, med- heart machines. Exactly. And, yeah. and so therefore, we if we wanted to make it completely legal and fair, we could respond in kind and you use an EMP on them. Sure. But they're already in the fourth century. All, right. All their electronics were already hardened, and everyone else in North Korea is essentially living in the Stone Age. Okay. So you can't respond in kind. So I just have to ask. I just every time I look at the news, and I just sort of clench up. I mean, how how real do you think the threat is at this point, and how out of control do you think these uh, these uh, missile tests are and firing ICBMs into the sea? Kim Jong Un's people have no idea what Kim Jong Un is doing. So the only way he'd go to war is if we publicly insulted him in front of his people. Sure. And that was actually the threat of, remember the Seth Rogen movie? Right, the interview. Right. Well, the big issue with the interview was that people in South Korea were going to attach the DVDs to balloons and float them over to North Korea, because that's literally the only way to get information over there. Sure. So as long as Kim Jong-un can look good for his own people, we're okay. Okay. But God forbid somehow we humiliate him, embarrass him in front of his own, then we're in trouble. Sure. Well, we've had – the problem with North Korea is we now have successfully removed any lever that we can pull with them. We can't use trade because we don't trade with them. We can't use diplomacy. From like the 1930s and you see what – it's really fascinating to see – uh, how minuscule the United States military oh, God, uh, yeah. presence was, where you just, you know, you, I remember seeing some sort of a scale where it was like, today's military presence, and it was measured by, you know, each little soldier cartoon represented, you know, 10,000 people, and it, there was barely any in, like, 1930, 1931, but, uh, but the greatest generation, also kind of racist, little racist well, generation. Well, they didn't call it racist or sexist or homophobic. <laughs> they, they just called it living their lives. They just called it living their lives. They, but they did do they did do a lot of stuff. You know, they I feel like they did. There are lessons to you know, good lessons to learn from them if you try to ignore all of. I mean, if you scoop that stuff away. But but just the idea of how to think about. Maybe think about money, but then, of course, after the war, this sort of after World War II, this like oh, there's Amer- there's prosperity, and now, and I can understand the idea of you know we want to give our kids the baby boomers, we want to give them yeah the a comfortable life that we didn't have because a lot of us were right. immigrants or a lot of us had to work and you know crawl into factory chimneys. And we want them to, but then, you know, so the baby boomers get cushy. My generation gets cushy, you know. And we get cynical. We say, what's it all about? We look at the baby boomers. Well, because basically we grew up in the wake of the baby boomers disaster where they started out idealistic. We're going to change the world. And then don't trust anyone over 30. And then they turn 30. Mm -hmm. And then they said, ah, screw it. Let's just buy a whole bunch of shit and vote for Ronald Reagan. Yuppies. And we grew up in the shadow of that. And we thought, oh, well, I guess revolutions don't happen. And ideals don't mean anything. And suddenly you've got Christian Slater and pump up the volume going, you know, just don't know what's popular anymore. All right. So you got Rubens and you could go to parties as Christian Slater. I could. You could be be a Christian Slater party club. I could read a counterinsurgency manual as Christian Slater. Who so likes listen, a poodle when you're diffusing an IED? Remember, <laughs> cut the red wire, not the blue. And then you have millennials who basically just are staring at themselves all the time. 
Well, that's our fault. I blame, I blame all millennials' problems on us because we never taught them anything. We never said, kids, you don't get a trophy for showing up. Right. And you're not awesome. You can do awesome things. Katie is a big supporter of this point, by the way, of like giving everyone a participation trophy and I'm, I'm, of, of not giving one every, everyone a participation trophy. from the 80s. <laughs> we didn't do that. I was right before. Well, it, doesn't, it does not teach – it does not give you a skill set if you don't understand how to overcome – no. Uh, and, no. And I think the great tragedy is millennials are statistically just better than we were. They're much more idealistic. They're much more positive. They're much more philanthropic. They actually have the potential to do some great things the way us Gen Xers didn't. What we need to teach them is guts and resilience. We need to teach them grit, like how to fail, how to recover from failure, how to keep going. You're not always going to have a safe space. You're right. There's no such thing as a safe space. Yeah. So uh, pick up the book, enjoy this Max Broad, uh, Brooks podcast return, and then uh, Max will just come on. Uh, I think we need to get Max on like once a year. We just need to have him back on as often as possible. Uh, so that's Max. Uh, this episode also brought to you by stamps.com. Uh, getting to the post office sucks. It's not, it's not enjoyable in any way. No one likes going to the post office. I mean, unless you live in a small town where you're the only person who goes in the post office yeah. and maybe it's run by your friends. But for <laughs> most people, going to the post office is an assy experience. So avoid the hassle of the post office and mail everything from postcards, envelopes, to packages, domestic or international with stamps.com. Buy and print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail. You click print mail, you're done. You hand it to your postal carrier. And unlike the post office, it never closes. Uh, 24-7, they're going to send you a digital scale that automatically calculates exact postage and help you decide the best class of mail based on your needs. So right now, you too can enjoy the Stamps.com service with a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus postage and a digital scale without long-term commitments. Go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in NERDIST. That is Stamps.com. Enter the promo code NERDIST. Stamps.com. Never go to the post office again. And now here's the NERDIST podcast, episode number 902, with Max Brooks returning and Katie rolling the thing. Now entering NERDIST.com. I brought Neil deGrasse Tyson's book, Astrophysics for People in a Hurry, next to your book because something has happened with books lately where the covers have gotten oh God, really right. satisfying to touch. Look They're at this. very tactile and very. This actually, and it's the same color scheme. Yeah. It's so I, I thought that yeah they seemed they seemed like wow. cousins they seemed well, like little it buddies. It is true. Uh, Katie, I the, want you to. That's the most satisfying. No, like, it's it's basically like if we're going to spend money to make a book, it better be nice. <laughs> I mean, people don't hold books in their hands that often anymore. No. Uh, do you read book books or do you read on Kindle? I read – it depends on what I have to read. Okay. <clears throat> like if I have to do stuff for West Point, there's no way I'm reading a counterinsurgency manual. Okay. I have to listen to it. I understand. I have to do Audible for like the big heavy text but for fun, yeah, no, for fun, <laughs> it's, I'm always just reading, you know. But who, who reads those types of books out loud? Oh, not enough soldiers, I'll tell you that. But Audible 